In my hometown of Aurora Falls, there is a yearly event where the fish migrate downstream at the beginning of May. There is a large river running straight through the city centre, allowing bystanders to watch the migration from the comfort of a hot dog stand near the riverbank. The migration is a sign that summer is right around the corner and a lot of townsfolk stop to watch it. A few vendors tend to stop by and if you're lucky, there might even be a few games and attractions. It isn't much, but it is one of those things you'll start to miss once you move away. I know I did. When I moved out to study at the University of Minnesota, I started thinking a lot about those old traditions back in my hometown. It was the kind of event that made you feel like you were part of something, like an in-joke. It was just something that everyone knew the importance of. The yearly migration, or migration day was just one of those things that outsiders don't get. The year I got engaged, Alan and I decided to travel back to Aurora. I wanted him to see the migration and experience the kind of small town love I'd grown up with. Not that I remember much of those days. He was a bit skeptic at first, like with most things, but the promise of food stands can go a long way. And as a bonus, he loves me. That goes a long way too. We arrived on a Saturday morning. Having no family left in town, there was nowhere for us to stay except at the one motel in town. After a short walk downtown, Alan and I met the town chaplain. I didn't know him very well, but he was excited to see me. Just seeing a familiar face, like a bird returning to the nest, could get a smile out of most townies. I could barely walk down the street without having people stopping to ask if it was really me. I'm so glad to see you, the chaplain said, following the world downstream right by us, just like the river. What a beautiful tapestry our lord weaves. I found him charming, but Alan thought it sounded a bit too... English majory. You know what I mean. We passed the afternoon with a few drinks, hot dogs, a walk through the nearby hiking trail, and watching the fishermen down at the docks. There was an expectation in the air. Everyone seemed to have plans for the night. Some other local kids were putting up lanterns along the river. Sixteen feet across, the kids called out to one another back and forth. They'd probably been promised fireworks. As the evening started to creep up on us, Alan was getting excited. There was just that sense of anticipation in the air. Seeing the shadows pass right by the lanterns and seeing the fish jump up and down, there was something natural to it. A reminder that we live in a fragile system and that no matter what happened out in the world, there was something tying us all to that one river in that one little town. As night came around, Alan held me tight. As we watched the oil lanterns light up, there was at least a hundred people huddled around both sides of the river. There seemed to be some sort of disagreement with the hardware store owner, Hamid, who had brought powerful spotlights and set them up along the bridge. Some said it just wasn't customary. Others standing upstream just didn't like to be blinded. Hamid, on the other hand, didn't care either way. He was there to make a show. As the clock crept up on 9pm, we spotted the first shadows. Fish as big as my arm slowly made their way down the river. First one then eight, and soon there were dozens, all hurrying down the river, one splash at a time. On one side of the river, they'd set up a hot dog stand. Some teenagers were drinking and causing a ruckus, but the local sheriff couldn't be bothered to even talk to them. Not even after the fireworks started going off. It was all the drama of a small town, all wrapped into one imperfect evening. Alan didn't seem to mind. In fact, he was smiling a bit more than usual. As more and more people were calling it a night, Alan and I stayed by the river. The teenagers rolled off to an after party. Hamid left his spotlights on and went home to his wife. A hot dog stand closed and the oil lights started going out one by one. Alan and I cuddled up, still watching the fish pass us by. There must have been hundreds of them, maybe thousands. Soon, we were the only ones left. As we decided to head back to the motel, 
we walked over the bridge. As we passed the spotlights, Alan stumbled on a cord, knocking out one of the spotlights into the river. By now, the oil lanterns had gone out. I tried to hurry Alan along, but he insisted on pulling the spotlight back up. Then, he fell off the bridge. One big splash, and he was under the surface. The following minutes was a blur of screams. I could hear him splashing in the water down below, but I couldn't see him anymore. The spotlight that had fallen off the bridge had gone out, and the other lights were angled incorrectly. My screams for help attracted a few locals, but no one could see or hear him. I barely even remembered what I did. It all felt so surreal, like it hadn't really happened. One moment he was there, the next moment he was gone. I panicked. Long into the night, all I could do was scream his name. But the strangest thing was the reaction of the other townsfolk. The consensus was that I was overreacting. It was as if they didn't even know who I was talking about. Still, they indulged me and tried their best to check the river. There was nothing. I was taken back to the police station and slept in the waiting room, wrapped in a fire blanket. Two officers stayed with me all night, making sure I was okay. They didn't seem all too worried about Alan. It was more of a reaction to me and my emotional state. Of course, I was upset and frustrated that they weren't taking me seriously. In the morning, there was no news of Alan. I got the impression that they'd barely even searched for him. I was so mad that I threw the coffee they handed me straight into the wall, screaming in their faces. Just tell me something, I demanded as the second officer started picking up the pieces of my mug. Just say where you've tried, where you've looked. Ma'am, please, said the younger officer. We have several eyewitnesses stating that you came here by yourself. Of course, this was nonsense. I'd been with Alan for years and there'd been plenty of evidence of the two of us not only being there, but there were plenty of witnesses who'd seen us throughout the day. I just started naming places, people, and what we'd done. It shut them up for a while. It didn't take them long to start asking questions. One lead after another. It all turned up nothing. Alan's car was strangely registered to me. They said I checked him alone at the motel and all my things had been moved to a smaller room. The vendor at the hot dog stand swore he'd see me there, alone. But that's when it hit me. I'd paid for the drinks at lunch, so I had a receipt. I always save my receipts. I shook out every receipt in my purse and went through them all one by one, and when I finally found the receipts from the previous day, I felt my heart skip a beat. There it was, black and white. All of Alan's drinks were gone from the receipt. Impossible. Over the following hours, it became clear that something was wrong. Alan was gone, and no one was helping me look for him. It was as if he'd just disappeared. Ahmed from the hardware store didn't even think about one of his spotlights falling into the river. It was as if nothing had ever happened. Two days passed in Aurora Falls. I tried calling Alan's parents. The number had been removed from my phone and they didn't seem to recognize my voice. All our photos were gone from my social media accounts. I called our friends, I called our landlord, I called his work. No one at any point had anything to say about him. In fact, some of them didn't even know who I was anymore. It came to a point where I was just standing there, blindly screaming at Alan's former roommate over the phone demanding they tell me something about him. Anything. Anything at all. They hung up. As night came around, I found myself walking along the river to clear my head. The gentle rustling of water cleared my head and gave me another chance to reflect on what was really going on. My panic had subsided to a sort of surrendered desperation. I was frustrated beyond anything I'd experienced but at the heart of it was a restlessness. 
If Alan had washed up on shore somewhere or gotten stuck or hurt, someone had to find him at some point. Still, the river reached all the way down to the next town over, Tomskog, and there was no way for me to check all of it on my own. After an eternity of walking, I just sat down by the river and cried into my phone. I had water up to my knees, but I didn't care. Coverage was long gone, but that little light in all that dark was a surprising amount of comfort. My background picture of me and Alan was gone. Some kind of factory reset. My sobs were interrupted as I felt something brush against my leg. The migration was still going strong, it seemed. It was pitch black out, so I turned my phone towards the river. There was no fish. It was bodies. They were floating downstream like a solid mass. Dozens, maybe hundreds, all with their faces turned down, shoulder to shoulder, not a muscle moving. Some nude, some fully clothed, some with broken accessories clinging to their carcass. Some woman with reading glasses hanging at the edge of her nose. A young man still clutching a backpack to his chest. Eyes wide open, faces turned down into the water. Almost surprised, as if they never anticipated losing their lives. Then, it hit me. The fish wasn't migrating. They were fleeing whatever the hell this was. I got to my feet. My leg had brushed against the arm of a young boy wearing swim trunks. He was one of the floaters in the front row. Floaters. Sounds so macabre. I just stared. It felt like my mind was going blind. Like I wanted to burn this image out of my head. Yet, I couldn't. Their eyes were perfect, diamonds just beneath the surface, all of them full of forgotten life. Then a thought struck me, a terrible, gut-wrenching thought. Alan. I followed the rows of floating people, muttering his name over and over. Maybe he was in the back, maybe he was the last one, maybe he wasn't even part of this. As I saw the bodies bump into one another, I noticed how eerily quiet it was. No birds, no splashing fish in the river, just me, my runaway breathing, and a hammering pulse that was forcing tears into my eyes. I couldn't find him. I looked five times over, following the streams of bodies, but there was nothing. He wasn't there. Still, I felt no relief. As I picked up my cell phone to film it all, the screen started burning with static. Black and white spots, physically burning into the display of the phone. I was so surprised I dropped it. Just as well, it had grown so hot it was smoking in a matter of seconds. There, on the riverbank, it combusted. A tiny metallic scream. Another death. Then, a noise. I couldn't tell what it was. I barely even knew where I was. I just blindly followed the river upstream. The tree line was close enough for bushes to block my path, but not so close that I couldn't get around them. Vegetation was sparse enough for me to see a close to 11 feet tall figure standing downstream, watching the bodies pass. The figure was dark, not just because of the hour of the day, but in essence and color. It was darker than night, like an ink blot on grey paper, like a shepherd watching his sheep. It lingered along the river. As I looked at it, it bent down to push one body who got stuck, almost lovingly. Right next to this ungodly being was an ordinary person, a stranger. Once the two noticed me, the uneven pair locked their eyes on me. The large being didn't seem to mind. The person next to it kept staring at me. From afar, they called out to me, like a frat boy yelling at an acquaintance from across the parking lot. You looking for someone? A man's voice, one I'd never heard before. I just nodded as the man walked up to me. The tall figure didn't move. Instead, it just kept ferrying the bodies along. Who are you looking for? The man asked. As he got closer, I got a better look at him. 
large, broken glasses barely hanging on their frame. He was staring at me with large, empty eyes, part terrified deer, part ravenous wolf. He had a shattered arm, as if he'd been hit by a car. He was pale as death, soaked in water. Another victim, or a victim to be. His feet squished as he adjusted himself. He only had a single shoe. M my fiance, Alan. All right, nodded the stranger, his head wobbling back and forth. Maybe his neck muscles were failing him. And what does he look like? I swallowed hard and threw a glance at the large being in the back. It paid us no mind. I could see the end of the trail of bodies further upstream. Alan wasn't there. Uh, it doesn't matter, I stuttered. He's not here, just let me go. I'll leave. Oh, you can go. Alan too, said the strange man, a squirt of water escaping his mouth. Just humor me. What does he look like? Then it hit me. I had no idea. This is where I have to admit something. At the time of writing, I know little to nothing about Alan. Alan isn't even his real name. I can't tell who he was, what he looked like. I have no idea where we met, and I can't remember the names of the people I called to find him. And standing there, in front of a drowning victim, I choked on my words. Talking about Alan had been the easiest thing in the world, but it felt like someone had thrown a blanket over my mind. How do you even know you've lost someone? He asked. How can you miss what you can't remember you ever had? That's not it, I huffed. He was here. We were together. We watched the migration. Who? I shook my head. Who what? Who was here? And that was the first time I couldn't remember his name. I hadn't even noticed how my engagement ring was gone. There wasn't even a mark left behind. I sank to my knees. I knew there was something there, in my heart, missing. I felt it. My body remembered something I didn't. Yet, I couldn't think of a name, or a face. I didn't even know where we'd first met. I remember meeting someone, at some place, but that was it. Please, I cried, there has to be... Something, asked the man. Something to make it all fair. No. No, little wheat, there isn't. Just walk away. What is this? What's going on? A harvest in spring, the man nodded. Same routine as last year. Who are you? I asked. I think you know, he answered. But I didn't. I blinked, and suddenly the giant figure towered above me. With a flick of an overgrown finger... A large spike pierced the neck of the drowning victim. In an effortless move, he was thrown into the river, sinking into the back of the line, face first. The broken glasses fell off and sank to the bottom of the river, but his shoe stayed put. The figure looked down on me. I have never felt so small. I forgot to breathe. I've never felt a presence like that. It was beyond fear. I was questioning my very place here, my world, my life. I felt much like the namesake I'd been given, like little wheat. The figure reached out a large finger, or a claw. Something sharp gently touched my forehead. It wasn't even fast, but I didn't know how to act. I just held my breath, hoping against hope to pass out before I got to experience the pain I knew was coming. I didn't want to float downstream with the others. I was even having a hard time caring about Alan. Then again, what Alan? Hello, the creature said. My world turned upside down as I fell into a dreamless sleep. The next day, I was found by a couple walking their Rottweilers. I was brought to the home and given plenty of fluids and aspirin. They wrapped me in blankets cared for me and called the police. Of course, nothing would come of it. I'd been established as an unstable individual, screaming about make-believe and imaginary people. 
There was no way I could tell them about the previous night without sounding like a maniac. Instead, I had a quick checkup, and then a return to the motel. I packed up my bags and got the keys to my car and prepared to go back home. I would never come back to Aurora Falls again. Even though, as of writing this, I don't think I'm even angry about it anymore. Though I know that I should be. I think a lot of people have lost a lot of love in Aurora Falls. I think once you have, you move out. But that makes me wonder. What made me leave my hometown all those years ago? It couldn't just have been my studies. I had family there. Or did I? Was I an orphan? How can I know for sure? I'm writing this all down, as I found my bag from that weekend stuffed away in the attic, and I want to put this all to paper before I forget what is left of it. There was this one thing I found at the bottom of the bag that kicked all this back into my head. Remember the drowned man? With the large glasses and only one shoe? The one who ended up as the floating body at the far end? At the bottom of my duffel bag, just beneath my favourite pair of jeans, I found his other shoe. I have worked in Shady Acres for 15 plus years now, seen all manner of things that have made me regret this field every once in a blue moon. I can't explain how painful it is to bond with a resident and lose them. My first real introduction to dementia was a sweet old woman named Rose. She came to Shady Acres due to her family being worried she wouldn't fare well in her home after a nasty fall. She had been living alone for some time and reluctantly agreed to be admitted. She had such a fiery spirit under that graceful southern charm. She'd clean a room instead of letting the janitors do it. She'd iron her clothes with an iron she'd somehow found. More than once, she snuck outside to try and tend to flower beds, cause, in her words, ain't no type of way to treat daylilies. Gotta talk to them when you water them, honey. All of the staff grew to love her, as did many of the patients. They love having something remind them of their younger years, how intent and driven it makes them when they catch wind of being able to do something other than watch TV. It's what makes it sad seeing how badly they want to be useful and active. Months passed, enjoying her antics, looking forward to what she would get into. Comfort came in this routine. There came a day Rose wasn't up early at the crack of dawn. She was normally the first in line for breakfast. I went to see her with a little succulent plant I'd bought for her as a gift, and found her staring out the window from a chair, quiet and still like a painting. When I called her name, she looked at me like a stranger. I know in retrospect she woke up and was likely confused and scared and disoriented. And I was no more comforting, being a six-foot behemoth in black scrubs in a doorway. She screamed and threw her pillows, pictures, the remote, anything she could grab came flying at me. It was only when she hit me in the nose with a hardback copy of Robinson Crusoe and I dropped that little potted plant that it let go of her. Initially, I wasn't very pleased, but it subsided into this acceptance of reality. She didn't mean to do it. I tried reassuring her through her crying and trying to wipe the blood off my face, that it was okay and there wasn't any hard feelings. She asked me and God for forgiveness. As the other staff came to de-escalate the situation and clean up, she claimed she didn't have any idea what took hold of her to do such a thing. Miss Rose, despite her nature, slipped further and further as the weeks turned to months. She had shown up a tender yet fierce southern belle. Her last months left her delirious at any given time, a listless shell of a once proud soul. She wouldn't talk, hardly would eat, seldom got out of bed unless it was the tinker with something her failing mind came up with. Winter came much the same that year. It wilted the day lilies outside into brown husks stealing the vibrant colour that once made them so pretty. I get teary when I see any orange flowers now. They remind me of Miss Rose. 
What began the stranger and more horrific side of things was during a freak snowstorm I had the misfortune of standing watch during. I had already made my rounds to take vitals for the night. This left me listening to random whirs and clicks of medical machines, hearing muffled gossip sessions from the nurses at the second desk down the hall, and a rerun of friends from somewhere the same direction. Average slow night in a nursing home. Towards three in the morning, I noticed the change in the environment around me. It had grown really quiet. It had grown cold. Even sitting under a vent, blasting warm air and bundled in a jacket from home. I got up to talk to the other nurses and found them with the same issue. We looked over the equipment and found it all still in order. All systems still operated. No alarms went off. But it felt like static had soaked into the air. Like the room was stuffed full of cotton and no noise could come through unless you were right there at whatever it was that made it. Shady acres felt disconnected from the outside as stepping through the door came with howling wind and almost warmer air despite snow falling to the ground. Back inside, it was the same uneasy silence, same static, the notion something unnatural was underfoot. Then, it began. Lights flickered one by one, starting at the emergency doors down the hall, as if some power-sucking snake was easing its way through the wiring. I felt such a sense of dread, I froze on the spot, like some small worm before a gigantic bird, and that snake went over me, jumping from the overheads to the side panel emergency lights, casual and deliberate, straight into the light, over Miss Rose's room. Every ounce of concern for her came crashing through that fear, and I must have been a blur to the passing eye as fast as I was moving to get to that room. The lights wouldn't turn on, so all I had was my phone light. The darkness seemed to swallow it up, despite the room being no bigger than one in a college dorm. Each step felt like it weighed a hundred pounds, every breath full of ice-cold air, and the hairs on my neck and arms stood stiff like something was behind me, under me, next to and around me. When I reached the bed, she looked at peace, full of colour, healthy and unbothered by how the room felt. She opened her dark brown eyes with the softest and sweetest look of contentment I've ever seen and placed a hand on mine, warm as a cup of coffee. Tend them flowers, honey. I got a ride to catch tonight. No sooner had she said that did my phone go out. The pressure rolled like a wave, then dissipated, taking the swallowing darkness, static, cold, and Miss Rose. I felt the warmth leave her in seconds, and when the power inevitably returned to her room, a lifeless body was all that remained. A wilted flower. I had to go outside the building. I swallowed hard to dislodge the lump of grief in my chest, fought to keep my tears inside. The alarms were going off now. In one night, we had six of our elderly population pass away, all peacefully and nothing more than old age. The next morning, I avoided a room. Couldn't go back inside of it just yet. Needed to process and grieve. I held together just fine until I reached my desk. She had one of the nurses put that succulent in a styrofoam cup from the dining hall. She treated that cup with as much care as she could muster. There it was, on my desk. I cried hard in the break room, bawled my eyes out, I'm ashamed to admit. She was the first of many I grew attached to, before I learned it best not to. In the following years, I started watching the lights in every room. Didn't matter how big or small, I focused on them every once in a while. In my mind, I figured if I could be there when it started, then I could sound the alarm and have whatever nurses were on hand to be vigilant. They saw what I was looking at for a few times. They knew I wasn't crazy, but we were never there for the start. We could only be there for the slow crawl to the room it was headed for when it passed us by. 
It didn't matter if we beat it to the room we figured out it was moving towards, screamed at it, wore crucifixes and prayed it away. It would arrive nonetheless and do the same thing it did with Miss Rose. Pressure, cold, lights out, didn't make a difference. We locked every door once to stop it and found the handle bent clean off of it and the internals of the lock tore open. So much as a flicker of light would send the staff on hand for that night into a frenzy. We knew it was impending death, and we as humans couldn't stop it from happening. It took a few more residents after that, same way as usual. We had one year when nothing happened, and we had months of relative ease to no losses due to the lights. Most of the other staff waved it off as superstition, and bad wiring suffering from even worse insulation. A lot of folks got comfortable again and put it behind them. The next time the lights came, it was the last day I worked there. Mr. Callahan had been a resident for longer than Miss Rose. We remembered his room a lot easier as the power room instead of 222, as the main breaker box was quite literally outside his room. He was a hardened old farmer, served in the Second World War and Korea, the kind of man you imagine when you read about the old school days of the United States. He's that guy. He had little family left over and they were unable to care for him, so they put him in shady acres. He was a lot like Miss Rose in how hard-headed and steel-willed he was. He'd go for walks in the morning around the property, said it helped his heart. We knew what helped his heart with the nitroglycerin pills he took and the meds that made his body accept the donated heart he'd gotten years ago. But we weren't going to discourage an active lifestyle. We weren't going to have him sit in his room and wait for the lights. A bad thunderstorm hit around June. Emergency generators kicked in to restore power. The nursing home looked like red hell in some areas. I heard an alarm go off behind me. One of the first in ages. It was Mr. Callahan's, and his heart was racing and beating erratically. SCA. I tore across my desk and met the other nurses rushing to his bed. One of them grabbed a defibrillator and had began administering paced shocks to get his heart back into proper rhythm. Those that weren't assisting Mr. Callahan were checking on other patients and making calls to the hospital to arrange a transfer. I was watching the emergency lights. They all were flashing, each and every one of them. It was moving with the heart monitor's beeps, and when they administered the defibrillator or lightning struck, they all would light up with burning intensity, like a welding arc. Cold began to spread. The room grew thick and uncomfortable, and much like the emergency lights, the pressure that formed would buck and writhe with each surge of electricity. We all grew desperate our orders and demands to each other full of fear. Mr. Callahan was no more better than when we began. He was choking our efforts off, making us sloppy, waiting for us to get too tired, too uncomfortable in the cold. It was mid-June. It was hot and humid outside, yet you could see your breath inside the room. I had no idea. So, I had an idea. A last attempt to stop the lights. I bolted out of the room and toward the west side of the nursing home. It was empty and I figured I wouldn't be challenged if I went that way, but it seemed whatever was there to claim Mr. Callahan knew my intent. Once I crossed the double doors, I found thick darkness, like a wall of nothingness. I'd been here for a decade and some change. I didn't need lights to find the AED, so I kept my frantic pace. I travelled maybe 10 feet before I heard the door slam shut, then the horrific sounds of tables and wheelchairs being thrown aside, something new that this entity could do. Computer screens flashed alive, machines strained and groaned with the surge of power and lights brought with it, and I could almost feel something barely missing the back of my scrub's collar. But I kept going. I cut a sharp corner at the watch desk area and listened to a stack of medical supplies and papers fly off a counter and down the hall. Thank God for these non-slip shoes. 
the AED hung on the wall just ahead and I tore that machine out of its box with sheer ape grip strength. Rushing back to the east side, I could see the nurses in the power room tending to him, and to the left, I could see the breaker box. I began to turn the AED on and take out the pads in preparation as I got closer. Five steps shy, I felt it grab me. I've never felt such pain in my senses, never felt my joints pop and throb in agony. My whole body seemed to lock up. It finally had caught me, and it was showing me what it felt like to oppose it. Nurses rushed to help me, but were thrown back through the air. Doors began to open and slam. The lights seemed to tremble off and on. The cold doubled into bone-chilling freeze. I couldn't get to my knees without being slammed with agony. It had held me down. It was going to put the one thing that would threaten its ritual out of commission long enough to finish the old man off. I forced numb fingers to close around the pads, made dead arms work my shirt up enough to expose my stomach, and gave all my strength to pinning the pads against me with one arm while the other reached for the button. I saw a lightning flash, and I hammered my finger against the shock button. Then, there was nothing. I spiralled in the void for what felt like years. I figured I had died. The sudden painful burn of smelling salts snapped me back into consciousness. I was laid against the wall, a machine hooked up to my arms. Everyone looked exhausted, some looked terrified, and some were asleep on the floor, drenched in sweat. Mr. Callahan's heart monitor beat steady and strong a soothing noise to end a nightmarish night. The next day, I put in my two weeks notice. I had seen enough. The residents were understandably shaken, but most believed that the wind from the thunderstorm had caused the freak accident. Some of them soon requested to be moved themselves. That will be the last night I spent watching and running from the lights. It all began a couple of years ago, but only now I am able to understand the horrible truth behind the mysterious events of my life. But let me start from the very beginning and not rush the events here. One day in March 2020, I was going to do a regular grocery store trip, so I took my jacket and stepped outside the front door, and I almost tripped. There was a small cardboard box lying on my porch with a typical Amazon tape covering the joint on top. Did the delivery guy mess up, was my first thought. I looked left and right instinctively, looking for a delivery van or any sign of a mailman, and of course, nobody was around. So, I picked up the box and checked the sticker. That's strange, I said to myself, as my eyes went over the address and name of the package. I was stated as the receiver but I was pretty sure that I didn't order anything from them ever since I bought all the Christmas presents back in mid-November. The box was very light, as if nothing was inside. It could have been a prank or a delivery system failure. Who knows? Maybe some computer at Sorting Factory malfunctioned and I've been awarded with an empty box sent to my door. So, my grocery plans got delayed a bit. I walked back to the house, picked up the kitchen knife from the rack and carefully opened the box. No chaotic movements, as I still thought that this was some sort of mistake, and at some point, the thing should be returned to the respective owner. Cautiously opening the box and getting through all the package pieces inside of it, I finally discovered the content of the package. Deep in the brown craft paper, a small plastic knife was buried. You know the type, the one they gave out in school canteens, to smear the butter from those small plastic capsules. This one was purple, and absolutely brand new. I even chuckled at that point, that this was the least expected item I could ever imagine to receive, and I was worried that I could get somebody's stuff. Anyway, to be extra sure, I logged onto my Amazon account and checked the order history. Everything was as it should be. The last thing I got, to be precise, was a set of fancy shot glasses for my friend, Matt, 
who was a wannabe bartender, and probably on his first step to a ladder called alcoholism. It was there. I double checked my billing pages, checked the inbox, just in case there was some sort of giveaway or anything. Nothing. Well, I thought, nobody will be too upset because of a missing plastic knife. So, I put the box into the garage just in case. Maybe next day somebody would notice the mistake and ask to return the precious possession. But nobody came the next day or even next week. No emails from the company, no nothing. By the end of the month, I had completely forgotten about this incident. April came around. Chirping birds, juicy greens all around, spring at its finest. Not that March was still winter, but it didn't feel as revitalizing as his following brother. Life was beautiful, and even with the grim news from around the world, it felt really good after a long snowy season. One day, the sun was shining extra bright, so I decided it would be a crime not to go outside. I picked up the keys and stepped through the front door into the vast warmth. Imagine my surprise when my eyes stumbled upon another mysterious box lying on a walkway next to my house. Okay, this can't be a coincidence. I quickly checked my surroundings. What if it really was a prank, and right now somebody's following me, so that the next day I can type in Boomer Gets Surprise Mail, prank 100% laugh in YouTube, and check myself in HD. But no, nobody was there. Or, let's be honest, I was unable to notice anything suspicious. I picked up the box. It was not that light this time. Probably a couple of pounds, maybe more. The sticker with my name and address was there again, right on top of the printed Amazon logo. This time, I took it a bit more serious. First thing, check in my accounts. Nothing suspicious on Amazon. No extra bills in my banking app. Next thing I did, I tried to call Amazon support. After 30 numbing minutes of waiting, some guy with a thick accent of an unknown origin picked up. I made him go through the system twice, but he assured me that they didn't send anything to my address neither last month nor this. I thanked him and hung up with a swarm of thoughts in my mind. No, I was not worried or anything. It was just so awkward strange and stupid at the same time. I decided to look inside the thing. This time, it was a CD player. It was an ancient Sony Walkman that used a couple of batteries and was considered hip and cool back in the days. This made absolutely no sense. It was brand new in original box, but I was pretty sure it was some sort of collector's reissue. You know the thing nowadays capitalism and the urge to feed on nostalgia. I even checked inside to see if any sort of CD was included, still hoping that this was some sort of prank and my friend would burn there. Haha, <laughs> we really wish we saw your face when you saw the box jack over the CD to freak me out and have a good laugh. But no. Again, I was left clueless with the item that I couldn't explain had to do with me. Next month, it was a pack of peanuts. Month after, a sketchbook, and in July, I got a PSP. When August came, and a box with what happened to be a pair of brand new red Converse shoes in it appeared, I lost my nerve. I went to the police station and spent a couple of hours waiting for the officer on duty to register my complaint, and then explaining the weirdness of the situation. By the look on his face, he was not really amused by my story. I wish I was at your place, to be honest. Free stuff every month. Who cares? Most probably, it's a bureaucratic mistake. You know, things like this happen all the time. Just for example, last year someone misplaced a zero in a form, so the paper company delivered to us 10,000 packs instead of the requested thousand. See, no big deal. If I were you, I'd give a call to Amazon and make them double check the stuff. Yes, I know you said you did it before. Maybe that guy had a bad day, I don't know. Don't hesitate to contact me if something serious happens. That was everything I heard from him by the time I finished my explanation. With no support from the local authorities, I had to care about my comfort all by myself. So, that meant war. 
At first, I moved my working desk to the window in the hall, so I could have a good sight of people coming to my front door at all times, and since we still had unions and human rights, I was pretty sure that deliveries were made during normal working hours. This approach failed. I must have been in one of the work calls and missed the September delivery. A pair of sunglasses. Then I took a webcam, a couple of apps and placed it in the corner of the window so that the walkway was recorded 24-7. The app would start recording as soon as any motion would be detected. Sounded like a solid plan at the time. I was somewhat proud of that technical solution. Imagine my frustration when it failed. That month, I got a pair of black suspenders. I rushed to my laptop and went through the logs. Nothing. I mean, there were a couple of videos where my neighbours were walking by my house. Some guy with a dog, even a stray cat sneaking. But no sign of a person who delivered the thing. Should I say that by that time, every single employee of Amazon customer support knew me by name, I guess. In the end, there were still no results. Nobody saw no errors in the software. There was no bureaucratic mistakes. The parcels just appeared from thin air. That was it. I was getting a top tier CCTV. The situation had started getting on my nerves. Money could solve a lot of problems and for sure they can speed up stuff. No later than three days after I got the suspenders, the cameras were up and running. I got a four pack so that every single inch of my front yard, door and walkway were covered by unsettling eyes of modern technology. A ladybug couldn't sneeze in my lawn without the system noticing. Guess what? The plan messed up royally. With November arrived the chill filled air and sitting on frostbitten planks on my porch, the next box awaited. It was a zippo lighter, plain one, no decor, no engravings, no clues whatsoever. I checked the camera logs twice, no, three times, and couldn't believe my eyes. The box just dropped down, from thin air. Wait, what? was my thought. Did the person notice my cameras and climbed on the roof to stay undetected? I went to the police again, this time with a copy of the video with little to no result. They said that since no harm was done, and I've received no threats whatsoever, they can't do anything about it. I wouldn't say I was losing my mind at the time, or scared to the bones, no. But what's for sure was that I was really frustrated and really annoyed. Further months were all the same. I've tracked, I've waited, I've ambushed, I've called, I've visited, I've complained and argued. Everything with little to no result. Little, as in, oh, it's you again. Sorry, we don't have anything to add at this point. Have a nice day. And nothing, as in no sign of the person who delivered the boxes. I went as serious as the contact to the higher regional management of Amazon. I, with the help of the higher power, whom I think was making that move just to get rid of me and bring peace and quiet to his support team, tried to track where exactly the labels with my name and address were printed. Imagine that. We've tried to locate the exact print machine, but that was like searching for a needle in a haystack. In the end, the whole idea failed. I called some people names, and I think I got into a custom blacklist or something. I lost my job at some point. My search for truth started to take way too much time. I had to sell my CCTV and some personal stuff to raise some money, so I had something to eat and pay for communications. Months passed, the pile of random stuff grew bigger. I became a proud owner of a sweater, backpack, can of vanilla flavoured soda, a pen, t-shirt with a skull painted on it, skateboard, pregnancy test and a couple more things I can't recall at this time. Last drop was a book that arrived in October. It was a copy of Fight Club. I'd had enough. That evening I got drunk and, as you know, we tend to get the best ideas when booze kicks in. So at some point in my delirium I thought, screw it all, I'll just move to a new place. Screw that guy. Surprisingly, after waking up with disgusting taste in my mouth and a pounding pain in my temple, 
the idea remained and still sounded like a good plan. I never claimed to be the toughest guy around, and I did what I could to solve the problem. It didn't work. I had two options now. Continue my struggle and wait till I get completely miserable and insane, or move to another place and start anew. After a couple of phone calls to the landlord, who was a really sweet lady, and telling her that I needed to move out ASAP, as I'll be taking care of a disabled relative from now on, and I'm not really proud of this lie, I was able to terminate the contract by losing my initial deposit. Who cared? I also called my good old friend Matt and asked him for his help with moving out. He would wonder why not just order a truck from a moving company, and I would answer, you must have missed the part where I lost my job. Anyway, Matt gladly agreed to help and promised to keep his pickup truck ready for my next phone call. That guy. I knew him all my life, but you know how adult life makes you separated as you get your own jobs, families and duties. Not that any of us had a family at that point. I didn't meet the missus yet, and Matt was already divorced. Anyway, point is, we were still good friends, and if something happened, we were always there to back each other up. I found a new crib pretty easily. It was not that far away from my current one, and the rent was quite affordable, especially in my financial situation. So, after signing the papers and being handed the keys, I gave my friend a call. A couple of hours later, we were carrying my humble belongings to the back of his truck. There wasn't too much, to be honest. As I was settling one of the boxes firmly in the car, I heard Matt giggle. Dude, what the hell? What's with all this stuff? Are you back in your punk phase or something? Wait, did that age crisis kick in? What do you mean? The Converse shoes, the tea, the board? Damn, you look like a dickhead in high school. He laughed. Well, do you see yourself back then, with all the hair and eyeliner? I replied. Yeah, those are the days. Wait, whoa, where'd you get this? He held the Walkman towards me. It's a long story. Don't bother, I sighed. This thing really reminds me of Brandon. Do you remember Brandon? That quiet guy who always had this stupid Walkman with him. I mean, everybody around used MP3 sticks already. Just not that guy. Oh wait, what the actual hell, man? What? I couldn't understand his interest. I'm pretty sure these are suspenders, just as the ones Mikey always wore. And this bag of peanuts? Remember Gina, the one who was really fat and couldn't cut down at snacks? So the doctors told her to substitute M&Ms with plain peanuts. Did you, like, start a museum of your childhood or something? These memories never came to mind. Both me and Matt finished school more than 20 years ago. And as a kid, I was always pretending I was on my own, like a lone wolf to look cool and hip, as we laid back in the days. Well, technically not the truth, as I had Matt and Corey and Barb. But you know how it could be. I mean, yeah. Sure, I could tell you that my balding friend here had massive hair when he was young, and you couldn't imagine him wearing anything but black, pretending he just crawled out of the cemetery or whatever goth kids did those days. But such details about other classmates. Well, at least not on the surface of my dome. Anyway, Matt uncovered the ugly truth. Somebody was sending me stuff, each one of which resembled one of our classmates. That was getting scary. I quickly explained to Matt where I got all the things and the mysterious way they have arrived at my front door. I also told him the reason I decided to move in the first place. Matt listened carefully and I noticed that slight glimpse of fear flashed somewhere deep in his eyes. By the end of the day, we moved everything to my new place and sat at the kitchen table with all the objects in front of us, trying to remember and identify each one of them and who they belong to. Do you have a yearbook? Asked Matt. No, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure I didn't even pick up the copy when they were handed out, I replied. Neither do I. But wait, I'm pretty sure Chloe still has one. Remember Chloe? The one with the pigtails? She was dating... I don't remember. Anyway, she lives nearby. We could pay her a visit tomorrow. That was the plan when we said goodbyes and Matt went back to his place. Next morning, he dropped by, and we went to uncover the mystery. 
Chloe Jacobs lived in a small villa with a family on the opposite side of town. It still looked tidy and simple, as if somebody's caring hand took care at every detail. Without hesitation, we knocked and put our best smile. A grim man opened and stared at us. It must have been the husband. We briefly explained who we were and asked if we could have a word with Chloe. What we heard shocked us. Chloe was no longer with us. She accidentally drowned in the communal pool a couple months before. That was the most unfortunate time we could get to visit this grieving man. I'm not really proud of what I did next, but I guess it had to be done. I faked and lied. I played my most upset mime and almost burst into tears, telling him a tale of how we were visiting all our classmates after 25 years from our graduation, and that it would be an honour to get something to remember her by. A yearbook would do. I swear, if that didn't work, I would also drop that I was dying from cancer or some other nonsense. I don't tend to think that I'm a horrible person, but this Amazon anomaly pushed me really hard beneath my limits. We left the house with the book in my firm grasp. Back at my place, we sat down and checked the photos. Purple butter knife belonged to Martin. Now I remember he told us a story about it and why it means so much to him, but I can't recall what exactly it was about. Black t-shirt was on Shirley, right there in the book. The pen, as we remembered looking at the photo, belonged to Christian. He always said he would become a writer and always carried a pen spinning it in his fingers, and so on and so on. Though, there was something strange with the book. The big group photo where all the class were posing together was missing from it, as if Chloe had cut it off with a scalpel or similar tool. I wondered why. Due to our calculation, there were just four items missing from the collection. I had twenty in my possession, and according to the memories, we were a class of 24 people. So it was Matt, me, Liam, and Hannah. Matt asked millions of questions. When and how those boxes arrived? Had I ever saw the van? The guy? What was the weather outside? A couple of times, I had to retell the whole thing anew. By the end of the day, I felt devastated. But I couldn't sleep that night. And the night after... I was thinking about who and why they would do this to us. Matt promised to keep an eye on my previous house. The asshole won't expect somebody else tracking him, so this sounded as if we had a chance. November came silently with no news at this point. Matt was sitting in his pickup by the house for I don't really know how many days straight. He turned his car into a mobile base, which sounds better than it smells. Trust me. We waited. I think it was November 15th or 16th when somebody knocked at my door. To clarify, I rented an apartment this time, so it could have been some neighbour asking for a couple of eggs or maybe Matt finally returning from his duty. I cracked open the door and damn it, there was a cardboard box. I quickly grabbed it and tore it apart. It was light as a feather. Inside laid hidden, and I almost broke it with my rough actions. An eyeliner pencil. Black one, with some stupid name like Children of the Night or Nosferatine. I can't recall now, as the only thought that flashed in my mind was... Matt. I gave him a call. No result. Another. No result. Was he asleep after all his surveillance or something? I rushed to my old place. There he was. That's his truck, and that's him sitting at the wheel. Is he asleep? Yeah, I bet. The guy took too much on his shoulders, and now you'll need a horn to wake him up, I thought. I came closer and leaned to a window. Gave a gentle knock. No response. His head leaned towards the wheel, as if he was in a deep sleep, drooling all over. Then, I noticed the engine was running. This was not funny. I knocked harder, shouting his name. Some lights blinked in the neighbouring houses. I saw silhouettes in the windows watching me. I didn't care. 
while sending punches and kicks to the door. Matt was not waking up. Finally, I found a stone nearby, and on the third attempt, managed to break the window. He wasn't breathing. Their inside made me dizzy. I will save you the time. He didn't make it. Official conclusion. Accidental death due to air exhaustion malfunction. They said that his truck was not maintained properly, so there was a leak and the gas made it inside, and since the windows were closed. I was devastated. I was at the brink. I didn't go to his funeral. It was a bit too much for me. There were three of us left. Next month, I received a hair comb. Hannah. Month after, walking cane. The one just like Liam had. My sanity was dancing on the tip of a knife. I became a ruin of a man. I didn't understand who, why, what was happening. After January's package, I headed towards the bus station and took the first bus departing. Even I didn't know where I would end. Yesterday, I was staying in this motel in the middle of nowhere when somebody knocked on my door. With trembling legs and holding my breath, I stopped in front of it. There was no peephole on the door. So, as confident as I could in this state, I asked, Who is it? Of course, there was no response. I froze, waiting. An envelope with an Amazon logo on it slipped under my door and I heard the steps moving away from my room. I quickly grabbed the envelope and tore it open. Inside, it was just a small piece of paper, or a photo to be precise. A photo cut of our class. All 24 of us, except... Everybody, except me, had an X crossing their faces. Another detail caught my attention. One guy had his face heavily covered with ink, as if somebody tried to erase it with paint. Who was that? I rapidly recounted the people in the photo. Twenty-five. It couldn't be. I counted again. Twenty-five, including me, the guy whose face was not covered. I reached the lock and threw the door open. At the light spot in the distance of the shaded parking lot stood a guy, smiling. And suddenly, I remembered. When we were kids, there was a wimpy kid in our class. He was a weirdo. Everybody hated him. I think his name was Gerald or Jeffrey, something like that. He was mean. He was gross. The kind of guy who would hide in the girls' bathroom to creep them out. The kind of guy who would eat his buggers and drool all over the place. He ruined so many field trips when we were kids. He was the reason we didn't show good results in local ratings. Every single person hated him. Even the teachers. But we couldn't just make him disappear. So yes, he was bullied all the time. But... He didn't seem to care about all the kicks and names we gave him, up to a point when the prank took place. After another failure that resulted in regional humiliation, some boys of our class designed a prank. They asked Hannah to write that Gerald guy a note, saying she's willing to give him a kiss if he was at his locker by the lunch break. The guys brought a crap ton of fireworks. We were young and stupid. The school was evacuated, and the smoke was flooding from the single locker where the screams and shrieks spread. Nobody stopped it from happening. Everybody was laughing at first when the guy cried for help. As a result, some people were fired, but none of us got suspended or punished. Everybody knew the guy was a failure, and it could totally be his fault. I think he lost the last dignity that day as he never pointed a finger to those who did it to him. We never saw him since that day. I've heard he was transferred to homeschooling after he got out of hospital, or that his family moved somewhere. Who cared? Right now, in front of me, I saw not a boy, but a man, smiling widely, waving at me. That moment, 
I understood everything. That we were the real culprits. The consequence of actions can cause even bigger consequence of actions. That what I thought was a thick accent of unknown origin sounded exactly like somebody with a mutilated face was speaking. I finally understood the meaning of revenge. I got less than 10 days left. February comes real soon. I gotta hide. I have to disappear. I'll do my best to survive, but my hopes are not high. As it seems, this guy is really persistent. You there, sitting behind the computer, listening to this. You clicked on this page, expecting a ritual, right? It's all in the title, of course. Well, I've got an interesting one for you. A ritual that I created myself and am willing to share with you. Now, imagine this. Babies within a room, screaming and crying at the top of their lungs. A busy subway train where nobody seems to know how to keep their damn mouths shut. Perhaps your apartment neighbour is too busy playing his loud, obnoxious music upstairs to realise that people like you need their beauty sleep. Seeing a common trend here? The world is so full of noise these days that it seems like there's never a place on earth where one can relax. But, what if there was? What if there was a place you could retreat to any time you like and escape from reality? Well, perhaps I could offer a solution to your problem. There are no catches or drawbacks. You'll be getting exactly what you desire. And if you follow my instructions, you should be relatively safe. Ready to try it? Well, here goes. Firstly, you'll want to set up your preparations. You shouldn't need much to practice this ritual, and you can set it up with common household items. You'll want to make sure you have a decent pair of soundproof headphones, a rose, a blindfold, or any material that can cover your sight, and a bag of ice. Also, although not required, I recommend you bring some duct tape. See, I told you that it didn't take much to perform this ritual. Now, it doesn't matter when or where you perform this ritual, but it is imperative that you go alone. If you go in groups, believe it or not, the trials will become harder and more dangerous for reasons which will become more obvious as we go on. Now, in order to make this whole wacky ritual work, you're going to need to start performing it as soon as I read off the procedures. As soon as you've completely heard the procedures, you have officially begun the ritual. That's right, this is where the first official instruction comes into play. By continuing past this point, you have agreed to continue on with this ritual. For, as soon as you start hearing the procedures, you are locked in for good. Warning, do not skip the procedures. If you do so, it is a sign to the higher powers that you do not wish to respect this sacred art, if you will. And they will forever steal your five senses and leave you helpless. Yes, this ritual has dangers such as this if you do not follow my directions. And yes, being internally robbed of your senses is as torturous as it sounds. Procedures Cover the windows and lock the doors. You and the optional, although not recommended, group of people you are practicing this ritual with would rather not be disturbed after this ritual commences. Find a bed or seat to lay or sit on. Make this place of rest comfortable, as your physical body will possibly be in that position for prolonged periods of time and you wouldn't want to find yourself covered in aches and pains now, would you? Set the items and materials collected before the ritual in a square formation around you. Now, think of the moments in your life which made you want to try this ritual in the first place. Perhaps a dinner date with a special someone was ruined because of a loud, obnoxious restaurant patron seated beside you. Maybe a small child crying in a movie theatre, ruining your experience for you. Whatever the case may be, try to ingrain that memory into your head. Picture the moment and imagine the sounds, smells and emotions within the memory. After you have done this, 
try to recreate the way you felt in that moment. Perhaps you were sad, or maybe anxiety or aggravation overcame you and swept all sense of joy away. Finally, open your eyes and look around you. Cop the bag of ice in your hands, place the duct tape over your mouth, place the headphones over your ears, and place the blindfold over your eyes. It is important you do these steps in order, for that is the order in which the trials await you. Finally, pick up the rose and give it a whiff. With that, you have finished the steps to begin the ritual. Hello there, if you're hearing this and haven't heard the procedures beforehand, expect to be stripped of your senses relatively soon. I'd hate to be blunt, but I did warn you about what would happen should you disrespect this ritual and proceed without listening through it properly. Should it be due to you not heeding my warning, or simply you not caring about your life in general, it is your decision that brought you here. However, if you broke the rules, you might as well use what time you have left with your sight and sanity to view. You might as well use what time you have left with your hearing and sanity to listen to what else this ritual has to behold. Now, if you did follow my instructions, then congratulations. You have now officially begun the ritual. By following through, you have allowed me into your mind, and now I shall be your official guide through this journey. A Jiminy Cricket of sorts, except for the fact that if you don't follow my instructions verbatim, the worst fate you'll encounter won't just be making a literal ass of yourself. Now, look around you. When you put on the blindfolds, you lost your ability to see, and your perception of the world got dark. But you can tell what you're seeing isn't the same darkness as the blinding material covering your eyes, can't you? Go ahead and reach out into the darkness before you. Reach straight ahead and feel along the surface you just touched. When you feel the switch, go ahead and give it a flick upward. There, that's better. The light above you should have lit up. Please ignore the flickering of the light. There aren't exactly the best technicians in this new reality you've entered. Welcome to the place where senses make no sense. A place where somewhere between your subconsciousness and whatever different dimensions exist. Now, approach the far right corner of the wall. See the skeleton over there? See its hollowed bones and the black mucus dripping down from its ribcage? Go ahead and reach inside its jaw. You may have to pry its mouth open a bit, but due to the decay of the bone, it should be easy to crack open. Go on, it's not like a dead man can feel pain. Now, do you see the key inside of its mouth? Take it from the skeleton and turn around. There before you should be a door that wasn't there before. If you want to enter it, Put the key into the keyhole and turn the doorknob. You are now unlocking the full extent of this new world where you currently reside. Step through the doorway with caution. You are about to start the first trial. You've now stepped through the doorway, and I bet you can't figure out what your first trial is. Well, not at first, anyway. Here, I'll give you a hint. Pinch your arm as hard as you can. No, really. Pinch it with the intent to inflict pain on yourself. You can't, can you? Your sense of pain and touch has been retracted. The room you're in should be fairly well lit. In fact, the setting should look fairly familiar to you. Most people either describe the setting as a school hallway of sorts, while others usually see a psychiatric ward or corridor. In all honesty, I personally don't consider the setting to be of much importance. Now, what may be important to you is what you're hearing right now. Do you hear it? It may seem faint at first, but surely you can hear it becoming louder ever so slowly. I can assure you that the moist gurgling sounds and the scraping of feet coming towards you is not just all in your imagination. Down the dark hall, you will surely be putting all your attention to now beholding a creature that has come for you. I can sense your heart is racing, and you have two choices. You can run in the opposite direction, 
Or you can stand there and stare at your impending doom in the face. I do recommend the first option, because only a fool would stick around to see the monstrosity coming for him. Coming for them. As you may have guessed, you are the first one to come across this ritual. There have been many others, and they desire the same as you. A place of silence, a resort of quietness where one can escape to for peace. However, there are creatures within this place that desire things as well. You find it strange to run, don't you? You can't feel the rush of wind against your skin. You can't feel your feet pounding on the ground. It's like you're weightless here. It's almost as if you don't physically exist. I wouldn't recommend stopping because of this though. Letting that thing catch you could cost you an arm and a leg, give or take some extra skin. And lord knows, that thing could use those. You should be coming across the end of the hall by this point. Do you see the three doors? Rush to them and try to open them. No matter which door you try to open first, it'll be the last door you attempt to open, which will be the one unlocked. Go ahead, try to get out before that thing catches up to you. Oh, and I should mention, the door handles are molten hot. It's a good thing you can't feel the searing hot pain course through your body, but I'm sure you can see your skin begin to melt, and the bubbles begin to rise and pop in your hand and arm with each grip to the doorknob. It's funny, isn't it, that you should be roiling on the floor right now, crying in pain as the melted and charred skin burns like hellfire, tearing your flesh and tissue apart. But no, you just open the last door and pass the first trial. Congratulations, that wasn't so hard, was it? Now, do you see the room around you? Another small room with a flickering light in it, but in the center of the room is a glass panel, and below that glass panel seems to be a pit of darkness with no end to it. Just the type of eternal pit of misery and despair that one would want to dive into, right? Well, I don't see you having much choice, considering that door won't be able to keep the monster out for long. Oh, you thought it was a one-time deal? I'm afraid not. There should be a grey sledgehammer in one of the corners of the room. There, the left corner behind you. Pick it up and smash the glass floor. I suggest you hurry. I'm sure I'm not the only one who could hear those long talons scratching at the door. There, one last hit and then you plummet below. Ready? Now jump. Oh, what? You thought I would deprive you of your sense of touch for this whole time? No, I'm not that inhumane. Yes, I see you clutching your arm in pain as the sensation of hot iron rods pierce your flesh. Still, there's no time to sit and sob. Stand up and look around. Everything seems normal, right? You're now in a plain open field, Taking the smell of the dandelions at your feet, listen as the birds chirp and feel the wet grass underneath your toes. Now, look up at the sky. Enjoy the blue skies and fluffy white clouds above you, because that paradise will be short-lived. Look again. No fields, no dandelions, no blue skies. Just you inside a cold, damp, stone room puddles of filthy mud and water randomly sprinkled about, and in the center of that room is a peculiar table with a plate on it. Approach it. Go on. The plate won't bite. No, you'll be doing all the biting here. Look down at the plate. Look at those slimy, wriggling worms. Look at the twitching moths and maggots squirming about and writhing in a crazy fashion. Do you see them? They're in pain. They're dying a slow, painful death. I understand fully that these beings are considered below you, but you surely must have sympathy for these living creatures. Put them out of their misery. Go on, kill them. No, no, don't smash them. That would be a complete waste of resource, wouldn't it? No, you see, your energy drains quickly in this land, and here, you need all the energy you can get. Go on. Swallow them. Why are you so hesitant? It's not like you'll be able to taste them. Go ahead and consume. You know you want to. Don't you feel the empty pit in your stomach? 
How unsatisfied and unsatiated you feel. Go on, chew. Do you feel those grimy, filthy creatures wriggling within your mouth? Their smooth skin rubbing against your gums? You can feel them struggling, but ultimately being broken to bits as they run down your throat and into your stomach. Yes, you feel yourself being replenished. Oh, what's this? You still have half your plate full, but you won't continue? Fine, but you need your energy, you know. I can make the pain in your arm worse. I can burn you beyond belief and beyond repair should you make me. Now, I don't think you want that, do you? Go ahead, slide the rest into your mouth, let them travel down your esophagus. There, don't you feel better? Good, now we can continue. Look to your right. Do you see the zipper on the floor? Go ahead and unzip it. Yes, unzip the floor. Now, climb into the hole you just unzipped. Oh, you don't want to? Well, I'm sure your nasty little stalker friend, who, may I add, is coming ever nearer to you as we speak, would be happy to help encourage you. Hey, you there. No, not the person performing the ritual. I mean you. The one who didn't follow through with the procedures. This person's doing pretty well, aren't they? Halfway there. And unlike you, they actually have a chance at living the rest of their life in peace. Now, of course, they can't hear me. They're stuck in the floor for the moment, right where I left them. Anyway, I'm sure a million questions are racing through your head right now. Allow me to introduce myself. I am the spirit who invented this ritual. I too was disturbed by the constant noise within the world. Everyone was always shouting and being so rude and belligerent, and I wanted an escape from it all. So, I created a safe haven where the senses don't apply. However, if humans wish to be granted entry into this world, they would need to prove to me that they truly deserved it. People like you, however, didn't feel the need to listen to me. So, here you are, spectating this sacred ritual before I shred your body of every ounce of sense you have left. Now, I'm no doctor, but all that time in seclusion, away from noise, can be damaging to one. I suppose my isolation did have its drawbacks. But what's the big deal? Who needs to see other living, breathing life forms when one can sit alone and not be bothered with the problems of the world? Even beings such as I prefer desolation to the outside world. But at what cost? The ability to have empathy for others? Tendencies to misguide others and lie? Well, a little trickery has never hurt anybody. Has it? Okay, unzip yourself from the floor now. That thing has passed, and it is now safe to come out. Observe the world around you. You're no longer in a dark, desolate room, but rather a room of clocks. Tick tock goes the clock. Oh, what do you mean there are no tickings or tockings? These clocks are working perfectly fine. I checked them this morning. It couldn't possibly be that you oh, can't hear them, could it? No, that's exactly what happened. Welcome to trial three. Your journey will soon be over. Of all the clocks in the room, I'm sure you've already seen the one you need to go to. That clock directly in front of you. Yes, it's huge, isn't it? Approach it and place your hand on the wood. Good. Now, close your eyes and feel the vibrations course through your veins. You can still feel those vibrations, right? Now, move your hand in a clockwise circle completely until you reach the point you started at. That's your 12. I'm sure you can guess what the rest of the numbers are. Place your hand on the number in the order of your birth date. Remember, don't lift your hand from the wood. That would have consequences, which I'd rather not discuss. But you're running out of time. Good, now that you're done with that, step backward and look up at the clock. There is now a staircase going up to the top of this giant clock. Walk up to the top of the staircase. You're now at the top of the clock. Good. Now look down at all the other smaller, lesser clocks. Feel the vibrations of the entire room. Feel them run through your body. 
Now, close your eyes, and don't you dare open them. The beast is in the room with you now, but don't run. Just saying those words, your heart rate increased heavily, didn't it? Well, you're going to have to settle down, because this next step, in particular, is tricky. Keep focusing on the vibrations. Do you feel the rhythm, the pattern in which the clocks tick and tock? Try to match your breathing and heart rate to that of the vibrations. If you can do this, you will be invisible to the creature. Now, this is not the time to ask me why I didn't tell you before that the beast wasn't able to see you. Calm your breathing and go to the beat of the clock. The creature stalking you isn't one simply interested in murdering you. No, it has an actual plan. You see, in this sensory deprived place, the beast has only one of its senses. That sense is hearing. Its hearing is so precise that it can distinguish between your breathing and the sound of the clocks ticking. You came here because you wanted a place where sound doesn't exist. Well, the creature wants you so it can steal your senses, senses which it has been deprived of for quite some time. Now, if you have completed the third stage, what I want you to do is jump off the clock you're currently standing on. Yes, I see that it's high above the ground. I still want you to jump. Would I ever lie to you? Of course not. When have I lied to you so far? This jump will lead you directly to the fourth trial. You're nearly there. Don't quit now. Besides, I'm sure the monster would love for me to tell it where you are. Hopefully, that's enough of an incentive for you. Good. Now jump. Well, what did you think would happen upon jumping? Did you fall to the ground? Of course you did. That's how gravity works. Granted, this was mostly for my enjoyment. But, I'm not sure what else you expected. Have a look around you. Is the landscape different again this time? Oh wait. You can't see. You've gone blind, haven't you? Well, you, my friend, are inside a system of tunnels and trails. The walls aren't too far apart, so you should be able to extend your arms and touch them. Feel that nice, mossy texture? Now, walk forward and guide yourself with your arms. What you need to do is find the exit to this maze. Continue walking forward until you feel the bump in the wall. Feel it? Grasp the bump and pull it downward. Congratulations, you just pulled a trap. Traps aren't good here, so I suggest you don't pull any more of them. Now, do you feel the sharp searing pain digging into the meteor leg? That's the trap at work. You wouldn't want to be caught in a trap, because, as you can see, the blades are twisting and turning, pulping your skin and muscle tissue. Now, grab the walls and pull yourself out. Oh boy, it's a good thing you can't see your leg right now. Your skin is completely shredded below the thigh. I'm surprised you're angry with me. You should have expected to make sacrifices. I can't just give gifts away for free now, can I? Now, keep walking before I activate a few more traps for you on my own accord. You know, you're lucky a being such as I would even consider giving you a gift such as this. Keep moving forward. You're almost done. Reach forward and grab the door handle. Pull it open and walk through. Your sight should be back now, and you should be standing in a room similar to the one you started in. There's a flickering light and everything. Congratulations on passing the ritual. You have proven to me that you are truly deserving of your haven without sound. Now, stand still as I explain to you what this prize means. You have gone through four trials of this ritual, and through them all, you have proven to me that you are capable of triumphing over challenges. Now, don't mind the sensation of your skin sizzling. Those boiling bubbles are back, and not just on your hands and arms, but on your face, your legs, and your torso as well. I know you're in pain now, but believe me, you will be utterly joyous when this is over. Can you feel the heat melting your nose away, leaving it just a charred blotch of burnt flesh? Feel your eyes disintegrate within seconds as the heat intensifies. You can feel it inside your mouth, can't you? Burning the roof of your mouth and your tongue. 
I know, you can't hear me right now. The pain you're under is probably too great to bear. But trust me, I'm fulfilling my promise to you, aren't I? By now, the only remnants of your previous self is your ears. Ironic, isn't it? That you wanted to lose your hearing, yet it is the only sense you shall retain. Don't worry though, there aren't many causes of noise here where you'll be staying. However, I can hear, based upon the desperate, drown out gurgles of agony escaping what was once your lips, that this outcome may not suit you well. You should have wanted this, so I'm confused as to why. However, I'm sure that you'll enjoy this silence and solitude eventually. It worked wonders for me. However, if you want your old form back, I recommend finding the next person who performs this ritual and stealing their senses too. Don't worry about finding them. Your hearing will be precise enough. By the way, thanks for the rose you brought me. Smell wasn't exactly required, but I do wholeheartedly accept the gift. In fact, none of the sense trials were completely necessary. However, it sure does make for one hell of an entertaining story. Oh, and for those of you listening to this, thank you for following through this journey. This has been a rare success of this ritual, and I'm glad you could join me to witness it. Hold on a bit. I know I promised the strip you of your senses and emotions. However, there appears to be someone else attempting to perform this ritual. And by the looks of it, the one who most recently partook in this ritual is already anxious to meet them. You ready, Bruce? My producer asks moments before we go live. You bet, I say. But it's a lie. I'm not ready. Not after last week's fiasco. How could I be? I check my mirror for any faults in my makeup, suck in my gut, then walk out on stage to a live studio audience. Enter music. The announcer introduces me. I glance down at my monitor and cringe. The producers make me out to be that sleazy game show host from the days of old, polyester and all. The camera guts to me, and we're live. Alright, I'm happy to be here. Hope you are too. I say, do my best Bob Barker impression. Let's bring out this week's contestant, shall we? I'm looking at the camera, as if asking the folks at home. And then... Cue the audience. Let's make a deal with the devil. This contestant takes to the podium. He's a paunchy, middle-aged man, casually dressed with broad shoulders and a generous chin. The camera follows him to the podium. Meanwhile, the audience is going berserk. Cut to me. Knock it off, I tell the audience playfully. They hush. Peter McNamara, tell us a little bit about yourself, why don't you? Cut to Peter, who's wiping his sweat-soaked forehead. Well, Bruce, back in high school, I was leading quarterbacks for the Mater Dei Monarchs. State champs, two years running. These days, I mostly sell insurance. Divorced, no kids, plus... Saving the best for last, I'm a lifelong Chargers fan. Crowd cheers. Alright, Peter. Are you ready to make a deal with the devil? He was... Great, then let's bring out Damien, shall we? Cue creepy music. Damien appears out of nowhere and is standing next to Peter. Tell me, Peter, I ask. Do you know the rules? Peter nods nervously, all the while glancing at the extremely tall man who appeared out of nowhere and is now standing next to him, wearing an outlandish devil suit. Great, so Peter... Tell Damien, and the rest of us, what is it you most desire? Just remember, cue the audience, the devil's in the details. Peter is shaking like a leaf. His head looks like a well-polished bowling ball. Well, Bruce, he says, I've given this a lot of thought. Cut to camera three. 
What I really want is a big old house on the beach and a big old swimming pool and a car built like a tank. The crowd agrees. Right away, I see the problem. He didn't stick to the script. What's this built like a tank nonsense? Where did that come from? Before each show, I sit down with a contestant and tell them how this works. I tell them exactly what to say, when to say it, and more important, what not to say. But the contestants always make a mistake, every week. One that ultimately costs them their lives, much to the fervor of the audience. Got to me, my pearly white teeth are plastered across the screen. All right then, let's ask the devil if he's willing to make a deal, shall we? Damien Carey is now towering over Peter, grinning like a used car salesman. He looms larger than life, both on and off the screen. Audiences love him. He dresses in a skin-tight red leather suit, pointed red tail, pitchfork and devil horns. But don't let this ridiculous attire fool you. It's all a distraction. Close above Damien, smiling devilishly into the camera. Well, 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 what do we have here? Damien asks in his guttural voice. Peter, is it? Hmm, I don't know. You ask for so much, but then you must ask yourself, how badly do you want these things? Are you willing to give your soul? Peter would. He really, really would. Excellent, Damien sneers into the camera. Just excellent. Camera shows Peter shaking hands with the devil. I take a cautionary step backward, trying my darndest not to show fear. I don't want to end up like the previous host. Who would? I cannot let that happen to me. Not while everyone is watching. Got to me. Well, that's just fabulous. So, cue audience. Let's make a deal with the devil. Camera zooms in on Peter who is sweating profusely, palms clenched, open mouth smiling. Cut to me. That's great. But tell me, Satan, what's the catch? There's always a catch. The catch is Bruce. He leers into the camera with his don't tell me I didn't warn you look. The car will be big, and it'll drive itself. Peter won't have to lift a finger. It'll be a smash. Close up of Peter, who appears as happy as a pig in feces. I hate the next part. Damien snaps his long and crooked finger. Poof. Peter is gone. Vanished. The crowd is aghast. They think this is all TV trickery. As the camera cuts to Damien, who's licking his paws and somehow wagging his tail, I recall how the previous host died. I can't get that image out of my head. They're still trying to scrape his stains off the floor, right where I'm standing, no less. But hey, the ratings speak for themselves. Give the people what they want. Damien is doing his devil shtick, and the audience is applauding him. Millions of viewers are watching, waiting for the inevitable carnage that will soon unfold. Meanwhile, the knots in my stomach are multiplying. My left leg is shaking. I'm stone cold terrified. Cut to a beach house where a group of partiers appear on the screen, showing off their California tans, sipping exotic drinks from colorful straws while they lounge around a large swimming pool in skimpy outfits. Cut to Peter, who's got a drink in each hand and a cheesy grin stamped across his face. Peter has become the embodiment of the American dream, right before our eyes. The audience rages on. I shudder. My stomach fills with butterflies. I know what's coming. If I screw this next part up, I'll see my career in hell. Camera cuts to me. So, Peter, tell the audience at home. How does it feel to finally have your dream home on the beach? Cut to Peter. The girls in the background are whooping and hollering and splashing about. I'll tell you what, Bruce, he says, sipping his drink, enjoying the view. It feels great. What comes next will haunt me at night.
when the lights are off and the camera is put away. Some things in life are impossible to forget, even for heartless Hollywood vampire types like myself. Cut to Damien, standing next to me, too close for comfort. Well, Peter, his voice sardonic and cruel, I can see you like the swimming pool. You do like the swimming pool, don't you? Screen shows Peter grinning ear to ear. Good. Well then, Damien says, licking his moist red lips. Let's cut to the chase. I think it's time to bring out the new car. Damien snaps his finger and a shiny new Hummer appears in the driveway. He's standing next to it, dangling a golden set of keys. I have no idea how he does this, or where those cameras come from. I'm not allowed to ask, which is fine by me. Some things are best unknown. Zoom in on Peter, who's running arms out to the driveway, carrying his fruit-filled drinks. The audience oohs and ahs. Wide shot of Damien and Peter standing toe-to-toe -to -toe in front of the Hummer. The Hummer glistens under the warm California sun. You asked for a big car, am I right? Damien asks in a bombastic voice. Um, yes Damien, I did. Well, is this one big enough? Peter nods approvingly. Excellent. So, what do you say Peter? Want to take it for a ride? Peter does. Damien snaps his finger. Suddenly, he and Peter are inside the Hummer, seat belts and all. Peter's drinks are nowhere to be seen. People at home think this is studio trickery. It isn't. Which is one of the reasons why I'm scared to death. I don't know how I ever talked myself into this gig. Cut the dash cam inside the vehicle. Damien is outwardly pleased. He leans into the camera. Good. Because. Cue the audience. The devil's in the details. They speed off. Peter's head thrusts back as they tear out the driveway onto the busy beachside boulevard. Damien is smiling, stone cold murder searing in his eyes. My hate for this madman is only outmatched by my fear of him. It's a good thing the camera is off me, because I'm looking like I'm about to puke. Cut to the helicopter cam. The audience watches with glee as the murder spree plays out. First, the Hummer guns down a beautiful young woman on rollerblades, blindsiding her. Her body disappears as the perilous vehicle effortlessly runs over her. Blood splashes across its shiny chrome grille as though biting into a strawberry full of razor blades. The audience is bloodthirsty. They want more. And they'll get it. Cut the dashboard cam. Peter looks worse than I feel. He's freaking out. Damien's devil-may-care grin is stretched across his long, reddened face. You're gonna love this next part, Peter. Multi-screen with dashcam and helicam shows the Hummer veering left onto the sandy beach. One man's head gets crushed like a grape. His brains splatter across his finely chiseled chest. His left eyeball lost in the many crevices of the crimson sand, while his lifeless body lies flattened on his blood-soaked beach towel. Beside him, a figure rests in twisted ruins with tire tracks tattooed across a sun-kissed corpse. His arms dangle futilely from its socket, like a noose swaying in the breeze. The third victim is caught in the grill of the Hummer. It does a few backflips as the vehicle comes to a halt. Its body falls limply onto the warm sand and stays there, blood and body parts and suntan lotion and all. Got to me, doing my darndest to appear casual. Incredible stuff, Damien, I say, wearing my staple on smile. That was one heck of a bargain you got there, Peter. Does the audience agree with me, or what? They do. Good. I hope each and every one of you at home agrees too. Cut to Damien, who's somehow back in the studio, standing at the podium next to me, twirling his long devil tail, smug as a bug on a rug. His eyes meet mine and fill me with dread.
close-up of me, my leg refusing to stay still. Let's see how things are going with Peter, shall we? Wide shot of the beach. The scene is horrific. Police everywhere, trying to regulate the manic crowd who, moments ago, were enjoying a picturesque afternoon on the beach. Camera zooms in on the girl wearing the rollerblades, lying face down in a pool of blood. Her neck snapped like a twig, her bleach blonde hair slathered in blood and tiny specks of brain. Multicam shows Peter from every angle as he tumbles out of the Hummer. The cops arrive in droves. They have him surrounded. Every bullet in America is pointed at him. His crying, phlegm and snot flowing from his ruby red nose like honey from a razor's edge. The cops are giving him orders, but he doesn't seem to notice. Instead, he's fumbling for his keys, talking gibberish. His keys slip from his fingers. The audience is biting their nails. Multicam shows me, trying not to vomit. I'm holding it back as best as I can. The show's almost over, I tell myself. I can make it through this. I must. Then I'm safe. Until next week, that is. Close up of Peter reaching for his keys. And that's the last thing he'll ever do. Multicam shows Peter from every possible angle as a banquet of bullets pulverizes flesh and bone. He flounders like a bloody ragdoll as his brains explode into a million pieces like ravioli hitting a fan. Then he falls flat on his bullet-ridden face. That's the end of Peter McNamara. The audience rages on. Cut to me. I'm ghost white and shaking like a leaf. It looks like Peter got the wrong end of that bargain. Much applause. Cue music. Zoom in on Damien standing over me, squeezing my shoulder, staring down at me with a deranged smile stamped across his demonic face. My legs still twitching, my stomach still in knots. Well, folks, I say with as much bravado as I can muster, be sure to tune in next week and try to have yourself a good night. I look forward to seeing you again next week on Q Audience. Let's make a deal. With the devil. The cracked screen fizzles in the darkness. It's the only thing still working in my immediate vicinity. It's littered with dead pixels and a faded magenta bar strikes down a segment of the screen's left half. But the visuals and the sound are still quite clear. Welcome to Mr. Sonny's Funhouse Retreat, warbles a cartoonish voice, and a soundbite of cheering children rumbles out of the speakers along after it. Sparks burst from a distended cable to my left. It hangs from the ceiling with exposed and dangerous wires. The screen shows me a POV of a camera, one held at the height of a child. The viewer is taken on a compressed, fade-cut tour of the Funhouse Retreat. It's an amusement park. The sun is shining, and all around are smiling children and happy families, eating ice cream and running from ride to ride. Colourful arches stand tall overhead, and friendly faces sell popcorn and stuffed animals from pathside carts and stands. A roller coaster whooshes by overhead to the sound of thrilled screams and cheers and the camera pans across the food gallery, inviting looking restaurants and milkshake bars. Mr. Sonny himself appears on screen. It glitches for a moment as he does so. Mr. Sonny is a costume character. He has an orange humanoid body and a large, soft yellow head. It looks like a grinning sun. The expression is fixed, of course. His mouth does not move as he speaks. The grin is stretched a little too wide. The eyes are staring and dead. It's impossible to tell who's wearing the costume. There is no exposed skin. The voice is masculine. Where the sun always shines, he boasts, putting one hand on his hip and throwing out the other in a comical wave, high-fiving a young boy who scampers past him. 
collect an autograph from me for a free Mr. Sonny Stuffed Buddy. Have you seen me yet today? Be sure to keep an eye out and come say hi if you do. He chuckles. The camera spins round in a circle, showcasing the best that the park has to offer as another roller coaster flies round in a spiral in the near distance. The camera completes its spin, and Mr. Sonny is closer. Unless, of course, I see you first. He laughs. The screen glitches again. It shows us more of the park. More well-tended trees and clean pavements. Posters adorned with grinning characters and immersive interactive games and stands. The camera shows us the retreat's water park. Large sprinklers send out blasts of raining water and children splash gleefully around in the puddles and pools. Mr. Sonny watches the antics from afar. Not for me, thanks, he laughs, putting out his hands. Mr. Sonny doesn't do too well with water. Hecate squirts him with a water gun and he jumps to his feet. Hey, why you little... The kid laughs and runs away as Mr. Sonny chases good-naturedly after him, shaking his fists in a playful display of mock outrage. The little movie fades to black, then, after a beat, begins again from the beginning, loot. The cable to my left sparks up again, and I make a note of this location on my little map. This ruined section of Funhouse. The map is my work in progress. I've scoped out most of the park already tonight, moved pieces into place, prepared. I stuff the map back into my jacket, then step through the smashed and moss-covered double doors to the outside world. Clouds have passed over the moon, and it is darker now than it was before. All around me is ruin. Forest-eaten and fungus-conquered steel carcasses, enormous skeletons of rusted metal and cracked plastics, shells and hollow shadows of monuments once so proud and so bright. There is no brightness here now. All remaining traces of colour have faded and lost the shades of murky, unfriendly green and rotted brown. I shift my backpack a little higher on my shoulders. It's heavy but necessary. I can manage. My flashlight remains strapped to my belt. I do not wish to turn it on as my eyes have adjusted well to the darkness. I continue my walk along the path and past the ruins of what was once a gift shop to my right. The glass in the windows is all but gone and a section of the roof has collapsed in on itself, taking some of the wall along with it. The gift shop stands opposite a scuffed statue of Mr. Sonny, standing tall and waving from the centre of a green and sludge-filled fountain. Mr. Sonny's eyes have been scratched completely from his face. Black ooze leaks from his joints and from the corners of his mouth. The moon reappears from behind the cloud and Mr. Sonny's shadow is sent long and dark out before him. I step through it and avert my gaze, carrying on along my way. Creeping vines slither beneath the concrete and the stone of the paths, and have cracked the walkway up at various and difficult to traverse angles. I don't want you to think that I'm not afraid of this place, because I am. I am terrified, and more than most would be. I pause to adjust my backpack again. It's nothing special, just the one I use for school. I tighten my belt. That's my dad's. I borrowed it from his tool shed. He won't notice. I pass by a billboard. The wording is hard to make out, but it boasts proudly the percentage of power that the park draws from hydroelectricity. There's a waterfall near the amusement park center, one that cascades into a pool ringed with both real and fake fiberglass rocks, and this waterfall feature is pictured on the billboard. The exact percentage of renewable power, however, cannot be read. The statistic is lost beneath layers of grime and weather damage. As I'm looking it over, something creaks and groans in the darkness. The noise is a long, low screech, and it sends rivers of ice across my skin. I shoot a look back behind me, and then stand stock still, waiting, keeping my breathing level and listening intently for anything further. 
something small skitters across the path beneath a rotted old bench. It's too fast for my eyes to catch it, but I silently pray that it's nothing more than a rat, or a squirrel. I wait a little longer, but nothing happens, so I carefully continue on along my way. I check my map. Not many more places to go now, just a few more. Taped to my map is a picture of a young boy and a younger girl. They have their arms around each other and both are smiling. The boy is me, the girl my sister. The picture gives me courage, it gives me strength. I grimace and slide the folded map back into my jacket. Down cracked stone steps and round the park's hillsides I go. It's difficult now to tell where the pavement ends and where the wild grass begins. There are no beautiful, carefully cultivated flowers here anymore, just vines and dark ferns and hungry undergrowth. The branches of trees stretch out far across the walkways. They wind through smashed windows of stalls and have absorbed nearby, long defunct machines into their wood. Pushing aside a cluster of leaves, I find myself in a segment of the park I have always hated, even before its collapse. The spider's web. An enormous figure of eight, comprised of steel beams and tracks, is laid out across the ground and away from me into the shadows of the trees and wreckage. Smallish, cup-shaped carts are affixed to the rails at various intervals, each big enough for three or perhaps four people to sit in. And overhead, above it all, is a colossal steel wire web. Shoots and forest grind drip down from the web's intersections and a monstrous, massive fiberglass spider perches across it, suspended forever in time, frozen mid-creep. Its eyes once glowed, but now they are dead and devoid of life. It looks almost as bad now as it did in my nightmares. Dare you ride? asks a provocative sign affixed to the section of the operating booth to the left. I daren't. Not today, nor any other for that matter. Instead, I take a deep, slow breath and step down from the concrete and onto the rails. I glance up at the great spider, childishly, as if it were going to suddenly burst into life. It does not, of course, and I set out through the enormous loops of steel, past the still and silent cup carts and kicking through the ferns and vines into the ride's very center, towards the standing stone in the middle. Back in the day, this stone was laid in cables and netting, but that has all fallen away and rotted now. The stone is glaring in its difference to its surroundings. This is no fake rock. It has not been constructed or painted. You can tell quite clearly in its appearance, in the sense of weight it conveys without even touching it. This rock is ancient. It's been here forever for far, far longer than the park, far older than the construction of Mr. Sunny's funhouse retreat. I stop at his base and crane my neck, looking up. There are a series of inscriptions in this stone, carved deep into the rock. On the left side are a series of simple holes. Near the top is a single hole. Below this single hole, and a little further down, are two. Two dots. Beneath the two are three dots, and so on and so on, all the way down. On the right hand side, directly across from and accompanying each set of dots, is a rough animalistic shape, a different carving for each set of dots. They appear as follows, and I shall tell you what I see. Beside the lone carved dot near the top of the standing stone is a small spiral creature, crudely carved but it looks something like an ammonite, one of those prehistoric fossils. Below these carvings, and beside the two circles, is a smallish snake. Like the ammonite above it, this carving, and indeed all the rest, is crude, but the head and body of the snake are clearer. The snake appears to be frilled. Beside the three dots is a lizard. It stands awkwardly on its back legs. Its frill has extended down its shoulders and back, 
Its limbs are clumsy and long. Below this are four dots. Beside the four dots is a rough carved man or man-like creature. Thin and boneless appendages have burst forth from the frills and the shoulders and creep out alongside its arms. Below the four are the five and beside the five is a thing more like an octopus than a man. Still stood hunched, eyes too void like pinpricks in the stone. Beneath are the six. Beside these six, the octopus is gone, and in its place is carved a wide circle. The circle has writhing and intertwined appendages going around and around, and the circle itself is ringed with eyes. Finally, at the very bottom and just below my eye level are seven clustered dots in the rock. Beside these seven is the edge of a tentacle. This tentacle was clearly part of a larger carving, one much larger than the carving above it. However, most of the stone here has been cracked and eroded away. Rubble sits among the ferns by my legs. I am washed in a dark and sinister wave of dread as my eyes scan this stone from top to bottom, as if there is something cold and shadowy squirming beneath my skin. I take a picture of the stone and make a note of my findings on my map, eager to leave this part of the park behind. And as my pen scrolls its way across the paper, my ears prick up at the sound of creaking metal. Not like before. This is closer and more constant. I swivel around at once. Nothing is immediately obvious to me at first. Just that noise in the gloom. An insect flits by my face and I swat it away and in the manner of some monstrous metal giant awakening from a slumber. The ride starts, to my utter dismay, to blink and grind into bleary life. Sparks start jumping out from the rails. Overhead lights fizzle and judder from dead, cracked glass into glowing trails of rails and eyes. The stone and myself and the overgrowth are all washed with a deep indigo light, and I am compelled to look up and over to the fiberglass spider in the steel wire web. Its eyes, one by one, begin burning with their own angry light. It's my nightmare. It's just like my nightmare, but it's all coming true. It's too soon, I muttered to myself, glancing down to my watch. I'm not ready. But I've seemingly run out of time. The map is hastily stored into my jacket, and my backpack bounces painfully against my upper back as they take off across the ride, jumping and dodging over the rails and trying to return to the safety of the concrete beyond. But, I do not make it in time. The cup-shaped carts have begun to shake, and they start to drift their way around the rails. Slowly at first, sure, but in no time at all, they have begun to whiz and whirr, spinning deliriously as they do so all around me in the forgotten lights of the spider's web. The jumping shadows play tricks in my mind. I have to keep glancing up to the spider to be sure that it isn't creeping its way across the web towards me. I take a step back in panic as a rush of air blasts past me, watching as the spinning cup shoots around in its perpetual path. The noise of the ride grows louder and louder. The lights flash. Over to my right sounds a terrible grinding and a fountain of sparks in white and gold. One of the cops has caught in the branches of the tree, and it spins angrily, stuck more or less in place as it tears off twigs and leaves in a flurry. Another cop over to my left disconnects entirely from the rails, broken as they are, and smashes violently into another going the opposite way. Metal and plastic fly in all directions as the ride goes faster and faster. The rush of air blows my hair back from my forehead, and I clench my fist in determination. Gotta wait for the right moment. One, two, three. I hop the rail before me and jump to the next safe section of grass as a cup goes hurtling around the tracks just behind me. The concrete of the path isn't far away. I can make it. The ride speakers, unseen, crackle and fizzle. The spider is hungry. A gravelly voice taunts and villainous laughter reverberates around the rails. A nearby billboard half buried in foliage depicts a cartoon Sunny racing around in one of the cups. 
In the billboard, it's clear that the cup is supposed to be the hollowed out shell of a spider's egg. It's not so obvious in the cups themselves now, following their seasons and seasons of damage and wear. In the picture, Mr. Sonny is grinning. He winks at the audience, despite the presence of the spider overhead. Saliva, or venom, drips from its fangs. I hop the next set of rails, stumbling a little, but catch myself and preventing a painful potential crash onto one of the carts, careening around and away. The spider is hungry, laughs the voice. Flee or face the terror of the spider. It begins to glitch out. The spider is hung. The spider is... The speakers crackle, and to my horror, the cadence of the voice changes somewhat. Children, it says. So brave, so courageous, ever the heroes, to trek so boldly into so dangerous a place, unarmed and reeking of innocence, so hopeful, so sweetly ignorant. It's his voice, Mr. Sonny's. I turn to look behind me, at the lights and the spider and the shadows and the screeching rails. Where are you? I whisper. The spider is hungry, laughs the voice. Sparks fly, and with a concerted exertion of effort, I jump suddenly forwards and scramble up one of the concrete steps, scrambling away from the danger, as the cup carts spin furiously round and round on their tracks beneath the watchful gaze of the spider. I don't have much time now. I take off at once, checking that nothing has fallen from my belt or my pockets as I consult the map. I take a sharp left and sprint through the ruins, past the old water park to the control center nearby. The water is dark and grim, a large plastic feature in the shallow end, a once friendly looking giant frog head, one that beamed with pride as children played in its mouth. It has now the appearance of some twisted leviathan, a lurking terror from the depths, leering at passers-by who dare to venture too close. My feet splash in the water as I cross the flooded ground. I ignore what might have been a series of bubbles from the darkness to my right. The control center, its prime, had the power to redistribute water and adjust pressures from various parts of the park. It can adjust the intensity of the waterfall. It can do all kinds of things. The glass is all smashed up here and the doors are either gone or cracked completely from their hinges so getting in isn't difficult. I consult my notes. I'm going to have to implement my plan much sooner than I'd expected. Darting to the appropriate section of controls, I spin a great and rusted wheel. I have to put a bit of effort in at first, as it clearly hasn't been touched in a long, long time. Gradually though, round and round it goes. I check the control panel, blinking lights that represent different areas of the park change color from yellow to red. Some blink dead entirely. I check to make sure that the appropriate levels are all in the right places. Pipes hiss and leak all around me. I ensure that the levers connected to the waterfall stems are directly engaged. Certain ones near the top, and particularly the ones in the pool at its base. My watch ticks. Time is not on my side. So, I take one last look, and I hope for the best. It's now or never. I flee the control room as shadows dance in the corners of my vision. Unable to shake the sensation that something is following me through the ruins, I take a shortcut through a nearby building. Mr. Sonny's 4D experience. Racing through a shattered emergency exit, and down corridor after corridor, I pass through one of the main rooms. The rows of seats are all empty now, of course, but as I try to maneuver my way through the room, the screen blares suddenly and loudly into life. The indigo light from the spider's web did not do much to help my night vision, but the light from the screen here obliterates it entirely. I shield my eyes in distress as white intensity blasts out from across the room. The screen cuts through colors, yellow, cyan, magenta, and then to black. And Mr. Sonny appears on screen. 
His permanent grin stretched across the yellow of his face. He peers down at the ghost audience, at myself caught in his glare. An artificial breeze begins to blow through the room, and I feel it rustling my clothes. Hello, friends. Mr. Sonny beams down at us. Computer technology has been used to make his mouth move. Not so permanent grin after all, then. The effect is disturbing and unsettling. Or should I say, friend? He says, peering a little closer. The breeze blows up into a wind. I stand my ground, staring at the monster through the screen. Black ooze leaks from the place that Mr. Sonny's head meets his neck. He twitches, and something writhes behind the mask. Something presses up against the headpiece, making one of his eyes temporarily bulge. You are trapped in the web now, child. I can help you, if you like. But I cannot do it from here. I stare at the monster. Afraid, yes but angry also. I can help you escape. I can help free you from this place. Mr. Sonny always helps those in need. I bore my hatred into the soulless eyes of Mr. Sonny, and the room darkens. He leers closer still. His little speech falters, and he changes his track. You are different, he says. You are not reacting as one would expect. What's your secret, child? I close my eyes, I gather myself, and I carry on along my way. I reach the end of a row and start heading down the steps toward the emergency exit. This seems to frustrate Mr. Sonny. I hear the jump in his emotions. Where are you going? Don't you know it's rude to walk away when someone is talking? And then his tone changes further. The supposed care for my well-being drops entirely. I hear terrible, terrible recognition in his voice. Oh, oh, that's right. How could I forget? Mr. Sonny laughs. I think we've met before, haven't we? Numberless Nolan, you were supposed to be my four. A striking shot of fear roots me suddenly to the spot and I cannot help but look back over my shoulder to the screen and the theatre room. Mr. Sonny's CGI mouth laughs wide. Never matter, your sister was an excellent four. She served deliciously. I'm sure you'd be glad to know. A visual of my sister is projected across the screen. I'm in the picture too. It shows us on the log flume ride, shouting gleefully. It's been a long time, numberless. I hope you've been well across these years. I've certainly missed you here. We've all missed you here. The lights change to red, and the wind rises. You will be my six, numberless Nolan. You will be my six, and then I'll only need one more. And how long will that take, do you think? A week or a month? How long before others are sent in after you? How long before more children come searching for exploration and adventure? And they will find me. They will find me. I crack my feet from their positions, glued as they are to the floor, and take off. I run through the emergency exit and down another moss-filled corridor as Mr. Sonny laughs loud and large from behind me. There is no escape now, number six. I run. And I run and I run. I smash through the broken doors to the rear of the building and take off towards the centre of the park, towards the waterfall and the rapids ride. The ride where I lost my sister forever. Laughter rumbles through the speakers, all crackling and sparking back into life as I run through the wreckage. Lost little boy, all alone in the darkness. I follow my map. I double check the location of the waiting area for the rapids ride. I used to come here a lot with my family, as a young kid, and I always hated that waiting area. It's underground, you see, and intensely claustrophobic. The sounds of the rushing rapids river were always churning overhead and all around, and I was constantly afraid that the walls would suddenly give out, 
that all those people waiting in line would be trapped and flooded as the water rushed in, transformed into desperate, clamoring bodies all scratching and clawing each other as they tried to scramble and swim the way to the surface. I arrive and check that the waiting area doors are still sealed shut. When they're open, they lead into a tunnel in the ground, but fallen metal has locked the entrance doors in place. There's only one way in and out now, and that's the waiting area's exit. The exit that leads directly up to the rapids ride itself. I carry on uphill to the ride's beginning. The waiting area yawns from the ground to my left. It's little more than a hole really, with some steps down into the gloom, and a flaked old handrail built into the wall. Most of the tiling walling beyond has broken off and fallen away, crumbled to wet dust on the waterlogged flooring. The waterfall is right beside us, the park's centerpiece. The sound of its constant rush, the ongoing pour of the water into the pool is loud, and I can feel the splashes drizzle against the side of my face. Puddles already forming on the ground beside me where the pool is leaking, and beginning to overflow through the cracks in the fiberglass rocks that it lines. Leaning up against these rocks is the panelling from one of the rapids rides rafts. It's large and roughly circular. It's the part you sit on, designed to look like wood, but it's actually made from hard plastic and fiberglass. It isn't connected to the raft, so there's no seats or sides, or any rubbery buoyancy ring or anything. Just the cracked, damaged old piece of a long broken raft, left here for someone to collect at some point. For someone to fix, but that someone never came. I look out over the wreckage of the park. The waterfall rushes to my right. The rapids ride quietly churns just behind me, and ahead is ruin. Show yourself, Mr. Sonny, I manage to croak out. Coward, monster. Shadows creep through the darkness. I take a step back though I'm careful not to step too close to the rapids ride and the churning river. It has just restarted of its own accord. I can hear the machinery crackle into life. The water starts pulsing, and the ride groans and churns as the rafts begin drifting down the river, though they aren't really drifting of course. They're not floating, at least not here in the boarding area. They're being dragged by mechanical gears and churning metal tracks bubbling and frothing. They're being hauled along by an underwater conveyor belt, a belt of ever-grinding and ever-chewing steel teeth. Warped theme park music begins to play from the speakers, slower and deeper than anyone would expect. My chest rises and falls. He's going to appear any second now. Mr. Sonny. A pair of old beam lights were in direction not far away on the path's opposite side. They're enormous old things, great spotlights that send patterns up into the sky. As with a spider's web, their light is a deep purple, and the way that the beam shimmers and warp give the nightmarish, dreamlike impression that the sky itself is shifting in slow, eerie waves. The ride rumbles and froths behind me, and Mr. Sonny appears from behind a corner ahead. I am further uphill than he, but he slithers disturbingly into view at the far end of a broken path from the darkness of the shadows. My blood freezes in my veins. His shape is just how I remembered him. How he looks in his media, how he looks in his statues, that horrible sun man suit, the mascot style costume. His eyes and expression are fixed. He shambles silently over the concrete step by step towards me, his suit ever shifting. There is a constant and inhuman motion in the arms, the hands, the fingers, the head, the legs, everywhere, a subtle writhing and squirming, all beneath the stained and faded yellow, beneath the dirt and grime-covered orange. The costume writhes as if filled with terrible, angry eels. Hello, Six. He whispers to me as he draws closer. You meet me here, by my rapids. His head twitches, 
ooze leaks from his neck. You won't be taken like your sister, you know. Like my beautiful four. No, your taking will be quite different. You must be so excited. You were wrong earlier, I whisper, the loudest voice I can manage in the presence of this demon. And what you said at the spider's web? You were wrong. Was I? How curious. I shouldn't think that that were the case. I am not wrong on many matters. I take a step back. He's closer now, reaching out a hand towards me. You called me a child. You said I was unarmed and reeking of innocence. I swing around my backpack and tear open the zip. I'm not a little kid anymore, monster. You think I've come to this place unarmed? Mr. Sonny increases his pace, cackling, and I draw from my backpack my father's pride and joy. I didn't just take his tool belt. I took this, his chainsaw, hard plastic green handle and shining metal teeth, and with a flick of the switch, it roars into life. I roar along with it and jump deliberately forwards, swinging the chainsaw round in a merciless arc, shuddering with the reverberations as it tears through Mr. Sonny's hand. He screams in surprise and staggers backwards, eyes still staring, grin still wide. With a burst of black fluid, his hand flies through the air and it slaps against the rock of the waterfall pool barrier beside us. Out spills shivering and desperate squirming black masses. Long and wet and writhing, like tentacles, they quiver and slap against the ground. I hold back a rise of vomit in my throat and press forwards with my attack. I wonder if Mr. Sonny can see the hatred in my eyes as I swing it wildly from left to right. I shave off another corner of his costume and Black Puss pours out in response. Mr. Sonny's screams turn quickly into laughter. I watch as the exposed squirming flesh in the arms of his suit hardens and calcifies. He stumbles backwards, still laughing until he has retreated into the shadows of the nearest available opening, down the steps to the waiting room for the rapids ride. I hesitate at the entrance. He finds this hilarious and laughs all the harder, disappearing into the shadows. Oh, number six, 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 so feisty. A wet and disgusting noise. Something between a cough and a burst of laughter echoes from the darkness. How very quaint. But I need you afraid, little child. I want you to embrace your fear. Come, come now into the darkness with me. Carry your weapon with you if you like. But come talk with me. Come talk, and if I'm impressed, then perhaps I shall tell you what happened to four. Hmm? Would you like to know where your sister can be found? Where you can find her. My sister. I let out a quiet, sad sigh, then take a step back from the waiting area's exit. Dropping the chainsaw, I instead grab a hold of the fiberglass panelling of the broken raft, the one resting against the waterfall pool's fake rocks, and with all my strength, I haul it down the steps and into place. It judders down the concrete and slams against the wall, where it becomes more or less lodged where it lands, blocking the doorway and the waiting area's only exit. An effective barrier. Before Mr. Sonny can react, I start grabbing up wreckage and flinging it clumsily into place. Old concrete blocks, broken bits of metal. I grab the twisted remains of an entire popcorn cart and with a grunt of exertion, I dump it down the stairs where it clatters into place up against the makeshift barrier. Mr. Sonny has caught on. I can see his shadowy shape and his dark, writhing tentacles with a fiberglass raft doesn't quite meet the edges of the passenger's entrance. What are you doing, Six? He asks me in his low, wet voice. You can't hope to trap me in here, surely. He slams up against it from the opposite side and it rumbles and rattles. He does so again. And while he does this, I pile it higher and higher with debris. With each successive chunk of heavy plastic or metal or concrete that are dumped down there, the harder it'll be to break free. 
Mr. Sonny starts hammering harder. Six, six, it's time to let me out, friend. If you ever want to know where to find your sister, then you must let me out. I grunt with exertion and rub my shoulders as he batters fruitlessly against the barrier. My sister is dead, Mr. Sonny, I mutter in response as the waterfall's pool beside me starts gushing and leaking out over the rocky walls. The dams are working quite nicely, it seems. Mr. Sonny slams against the barrier. He yells at me to let him free. But I don't. I just watch as the water spills over the edge and begins pouring its way down the steps and towards the debris, pouring right into the waiting area in which Mr. Sonny finds himself trapped. I use the chainsaw again, where I'm able to cut away sections of the fiberglass rock wall, the border to the waterfall's pool now brimming and frothing and dangerously overflowing, and more and more water begins pouring out and directly down the steps. It splashes against my clothes, my shoes, drenching me as I work, but the water keeps flowing faster and faster and faster. Mr. Sonny stops hammering against the barrier I've created. I presume he has slithered away to test the doors of the tunnel's opposite end. A shiver of vengeful electricity passes through me. He will find them sealed. There is no way out. The waterfall surges. It pours relentlessly down into the tunnel. More and more and more. Mr. Sonny begins to scream. I watch as he tries to slither a tentacle through a gap in the barrier. Before he can calcify it, I slice it messily off with a chainsaw. Ooze and bile splashes up across the fiberglass, and he screeches in distress. A few minutes more, and the rocky barrier guarding the pool has been entirely cut away in just the right places, and the waterfall begins to thunder more or less directly down into the tunnel, filling the waiting area as it did in my childish nightmares, drowning all those who wait within. Mr. Sonny screams at me. He makes me promises and he hints at greater truths and secrets. And I let him. I let him say whatever it is that he wants. Soon his voice is lost beneath the rush of the water. I sit on a piece of fallen billboard. And I watch. I watch and I wait until the entrance to the tunnel is entirely underwater. And then I wait a little longer. I wait until the rush of the water from the waterfall has filled the tunnel entirely, until it starts to pour and leak downhill as it rushes into the river of the rapids ride. And that's when I take my leave. I gather up all my belongings. I hoist my backpack up onto my shoulders and I make my way back through the park. I think about my sister as I leave this terrible place behind. Burn in hell, Mr. Sonny, I mutter, as one by one, the lights of the park blink dead. I squint through the snowstorm and look down to my watch, raising it a little closer to my face for a better look. But I don't know why I bother. It's just a force of habit, I guess. The watch is broken. It's always broken. I should replace it, really. After all, who wears a broken watch? I just can't bring myself to do so. It was passed down from my granddad, through my brother. Three different repair places all turned me away and said it was impossible to fix. Too old, they said. Sounds like BS to me, but hey, what do I know? I shiver and my gaze returns to my surroundings. I draw my coat a little tighter around my body. The storm rages. All around is snow and an endless world of white, illuminated through the dark with the misblurred orange of the endless, dutiful street lamps. I carry on trudging along my way. At the beginning of the night, right after the bus dropped me off, I considered waiting in the spot I was left behind, waiting for the driver to realise his error and come back and get me. But it was too cold for standing around, so 
I started walking down the road, following the bus's direction of travel. It's been a few hours now, and the bus never came back. So yeah. Hey, my name is Sam by the way. I'm 15 and I'm lost in the snow. I didn't realise the mistake until the bus had driven away. The storm beyond the windows was too thick. And hell, why shouldn't it be dropping me off in the right place? It's always the right place. Never, never ever am I dropped off in the wrong location. Except for this evening, it would seem. This, the evening of the storm. I grimace and close my eyes tight shut against the cold, barreling gust of icy wind. I have no idea where I am. Maps isn't working, but I should be okay. I'll just keep following the road until I find something I recognize. Soon, for sure. And so, I walk, I walk, and I walk. It's maybe three or so hours until I really start to feel the first stages of panic settling in. The air only feels like it's getting colder and colder, sharper and sharper. There's no one home right now to come and collect me. So, what am I supposed to do? I check my phone again as the battery steadily drops. The device shakes in my shivering hand. Come on, I mutter, grimacing. Looking around for a countless time. Come on, give me something here, something. And if I squint, if I squint just right... There, through the blizzard, is a different kind of light. Faint at first, and paler than the orange of the street lamps, but it's different enough. Distinct, yellow and soft, spilling through the windows of a long building a little ways back from the road. It could be an office block or something. I decide to go for it, turning away from the road and trudging a path through the fallen snow to the building's entrance. As I approach, I realise that the building isn't an office at all, in fact. It's a school. Not mine, nor one that I recognise, but a school nonetheless. Damn, it's probably locked up tight, I think aloud as I reach the front doors. But, to my surprise, they push right open at my touch, and so I head on inside. It's not particularly warm in here, but hey, at least it's out of the wind and the snow. My footsteps echo on the hard floor. The door closes with a thunk behind me, and the sounds of the weather are dulled. I draw down my hood and allow myself a breath. It fogs and clouds out into the surrounding airs, and I look around. The school's main lobby is illuminated like two of its off-shooting corridors, with a faint, warning light. The light in corridor three is flickering silently, and the light of the fourth is non-existent. Dead. Dark and a picture of shadows. An unfamiliar emblem is emblazoned on the wall to my left, above the motto, Ad Mortem Ad Lucem. A disturbing sense of unease passes through me. The light flickers and the air chills. I try to clear my throat, but the noise sounds distant and far away. My breath clouds around my face, and a shadow, vast and long, squirms into my field of vision across the walls and floor. Slowly, as if beneath a body of water, I turn my head. I turn to look behind me and stagger away in horror, as fast as this newly thickened air will allow. Beyond the glass of the entrance doors and drifting through the snow and shadows in the air is a living nightmare. What appears, bizarrely, to be something akin to an enormous eel, black and creeping, slithering its way through the evening air as if the storm were the bottom of the sea. His jaws cracks open a slither, and as it passes me by, I see its teeth, grey and spiked and beyond count. Its eyes fix upon me. It glows like the light of the school. Yellow, only brighter. The pupil of this great eel is rectangular, in the manner of a goat and deeper and darker and blacker than anything I've ever seen. To meet this thing's stare is to look back into the eye of the abyss. It drifts past the door at a right angle, its long and snake-like body following on behind, and I tear my eyes away. Damn it, I stutter uselessly. Damn, no. And I turn tail to run, away from the doors and deeper into the building. I pass by a window to my right 
and see in my peripheral another dark shadow. A second of these creatures, perhaps, as it swims through the snowstorm outside. What the hell is happening? I shout out loud, hoping to break through the sounds of my breathing and my beating heart as I tear down the hall and round corner after corner. I find myself drawn to an ascending staircase, and so up I climb after a quick check over my shoulder. I don't think the creatures can enter into the building, but the flickering lights and the dancing shadows are playing tricks on me. I climb as quickly as I'm able and crash down into the nearest classroom, fumbling and stumbling amongst the chairs and landing on the ground in the dark. I catch my breath. The only light comes through the glass in the classroom door and through the long window beside me. The blinds are open and the snowstorm rages beyond. The light of a street lamp, faint and far as it is, filters calmly inside. It illuminates the tips and edges of the chairs and tables. It casts a glossy, reflective shine across the artwork, presumably drawn and painted by students, hung on the walls. And across the hair of the girl, resting casually on the counter. Hey, she says with a smile, and I recall in surprise. What the? Who are you? I ask, stuttering. Sorry about the eels. They're here for me, not for you. But best to avoid them all the same, she says, dodging the question and brushing a strand of hair from her face. She tucks it behind her ear. I realize that at some point I have bitten my lip and it throbs painfully. I rub a thumb across the freshly forming bump. What's your name? I ask. What are you doing here? Are we safe? She shrugs. Pretty safe, I guess, for now. She glances to the window and gently kicks a heel against the counter. My name is Ellie. I'm just hanging out. Do you have a name? Of course I have a name, I reply, irritated. It's Sam. Is this... Jeez, is this your school then? She shrugs again. Kinda. I glance from the door to the window and clamber up to my feet taking a seat opposite her on a nearby desk. My dumb teenage brain tries to work out if she's cute or not. She kind of is, I guess. More importantly though, I'm trying to decide if her presence here has heightened or lessened the imminent danger. Could you just stop screwing around for a second? What the hell is going on? Eels? Massive eels in the snow? They aren't actually eels, obviously. That would be moronic. They just look like eels. So what are they then? Why are they hanging around here, around your school? She shifts and brings her hand up to her shoulder to rub her arm. Don't worry about it. It's not really a problem. Not my problem, I repeat, eyebrows furrowed. Uh, well, I would disagree a little. I throw out my hands. What is happening? Her tone shifts to a defensive one. Jeez, if you're going to be a whiny little baby, you can just go, okay? I didn't ask for you to come here. I already told you, they aren't here for you. They're here for me. Ellie crosses her arms and stands up from the desk, turning and walking away to face the window. Whiny little baby. Oof. We both watch as the enormous shadow of one of the creatures drifts past the glass, temporarily throwing a coat of shadow across the room. The snow falls. Diplomacy, Sam. I rub my chin. I want answers here. All right, I say. I'm sorry. She turns back to look at me, and I speak on. I'm just freaked out, okay? You seem a lot more in control of the situation. I just... I'd like to be at the same level you are. I hold out my hand, and offer for her to shake it, a peace offering, and my grandfather's watch catches in the light. Her eyes dart to it at once, and her expression changes completely. She squeals a little and puts her face right close to it. That is gorgeous, she says. Oh my goodness, where did you get this? Can I see it? Why is she not concerned with the monsters outside? Uh, yeah, sure. Here, take it. I unclasp it from my wrist and make to hand it to her. But she takes a sudden step back. Oh no, it's okay. If you could just set it down on the table, that would be great. I pause. 
You want me to just set it down on the table? She nods and smiles pleasantly. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. I do as she asks, and instead of passing the watch directly to her, I instead place it gently down on the nearest desk. She rests on its surface, one hand on either side of the timepiece, and gets her face really close to it. You were wearing it on the wrong wrist, you know, she says as she studies the thing. I shrug again, irritated. Well, I'm left-handed, so... And it doesn't work? She asks me. It's broken. Why would you wear a broken watch? Even a broken watch is right twice a day, I reply dryly. And to my surprise, she actually laughs. I chuckle too, a little awkwardly in surprise. Sure, she says, sticking out her tongue. The shadow of the eel drifts right past the window. Again, we are cast in shadow as it passes us by, swimming through the rush of the storm. Please, just tell me what's going on alright, I say to her, my temporarily misplaced fear returning at full force. Come on, don't play around with me. Are we actually in danger? I certainly feel in danger. She ignores me, squinting carefully at the broken watch, muttering quietly in thought to herself. Time, she says. It's such a funny thing. Hey, I say. Hey, enough is enough. I step forward and reach out to grab her arm. But in my attempt, my hand passes right through her skin. Her skin and body and everything else. She is massless, and I watch as my hand passes effortlessly right through her arm, translucent and flickering. After a moment of processing, I take a silent and horrified step back. She sighs and straightens, brushing that same strand of hair behind her ear. She no longer looks as solid, or indeed as grounded as she did mere moments ago. I'm sorry you ended up here tonight, she says quietly. The wind whistles beyond the walls, and the snowstorm rages. So, what's your deal, Ellie? I ask, mouth dry. Are you a ghost or something? It's meant as a half-joke, really, but the question hangs in the air. She wrinkles her nose, then shrugs. I laugh nervously. So... Are you a ghost then? I'm not alive anymore, if that's what you're wondering. She nods to the window. That's why the creatures are after me. I'm not... Still supposed to be here. Oh, I reply simply. For some reason, I see in my mind's eye a rough bird's eye view of the school, piled high with and surrounded by snow. Faint yellow light shining from the windows in the storm as the eels circle around and around. I could run. I could just turn around and run back the way I came, back into the storm. Though I'm not convinced by what she tells me. The idea that the eels will just ignore me is a nice one, but I don't know how true it is. I'm not sure she really knows either. How did you die? I ask a little awkwardly, if you don't mind me asking. She doesn't reply at first. She only goes back to studying the watch. She holds her hands above it, and then I observe in awe as she draws them suddenly back, and a glowing representation of the watch's inner mechanisms are blown up and fixed in place in the air just above us, cogs and gears, all stilled. Whoa, I murmur, and she smiles. Then she sighs, and the smile escapes from her face. You can see for yourself if you really want she says, pointing to the mirror in the corner of the room. Though it's not a fun story, so be warned, I guess. Cautiously, I make to head over, and she seems to have second thoughts. Wait, she says suddenly. Actually, I don't think that's much of a good idea. You should just leave, honestly. The creatures won't hurt you. I'm just waiting here. Seriously, you don't have to look. But it's too late now. My curiosity is piqued, and it might as well count towards my safety and survival. So, I turn back to the mirror and stride towards it. Wait, she shouts as I put out a hand, and it passes through the surface of the mirror like water. All around me at once is mist, 
swirling, glass-like mist and distorted cries from behind. Ellie is calling me back, but it's too late. I have stepped through and now I'm falling. There is nothing to keep me anchored, and I land with a thump and a groan at the entrance to the school. I'm outside, but there is no snow right now. I jump to my feet and receive some strange looks, as I'm surrounded by kids, all roughly my own age, though I don't recognize a single person by sight. I glance back to the building. It's very different in the pale grey light of this particular overcast morning, but it's the same school alright. But when? I'm an avid reader, and it always infuriates me when I'm forced to spend paragraph after paragraph and page after page reading through the main character's gaping and gawking and narrow-minded disbelief. So I swore to myself once, many years ago, that if I ever found myself in an unlikely and unpredictable situation, that I would do my best to just roll with it, to take stock and act as logically as I'm able. So I take off my coat and wrap it around my waist. I smooth back some of the ruffles in my hair and do my best to uphold their promise. I take a quick look behind me, but naturally any evidence of a mirror or any kind of ethereal doorway has vanished. Very well. I turn back to the entrance doors to the school and I join my apparent peers, climbing the steps and heading on inside. The kids all around me are giving me strange looks and I am once again incredibly self-conscious. Who's the new kid? I hear one girl whisper to another. I glance to my left at the school's logo. Ad Meloria had Lusum. I wonder for the second time what it might mean. Nothing, probably. Schools around here love their Latin mottos. Around where, Sam? Where the hell even are you? I reach down to my pocket for my phone. A renewed chance to check maps, perhaps. But my pockets are empty. You can't take anything with you, comes the voice of Ellie from above and all around, and I swivel on the spot, staring up at the ceiling. Hey, where are you? I call out and the other conversations around me fall to a hush and then change to stifled laughter. Who the hell is this guy talking to? I flush and make a stride down one of the school's corridors, bumping hard into a girl in a bright purple coat as I do so, knocking her books to the floor. She looks up at me and flushes in turn, brow furrowed. And it's her. It's Ellie. Ellie, I say. Help me out of here, please. At least a little clue would be nice. She stares at me, expression uncertain. Then, after a pause, Sorry, do I know you? I cock my head. It's Sam? We were speaking just now. You called out to me? She shakes her head, maintaining eye contact. No, no sorry. I don't remember you. I'm sorry. Get a grip, Sam. Think logically. Right, I manage. I'm um, sorry. Here, let me... Let me help you with this stuff. I crouch down to the ground to collect the books. Two science books and a purple, personal journal of some kind. It's fallen open to a page with a header. Last day. Beneath is a list of stuff. I manage to read a couple of the items in confusion before she snatches it out of my hand. Apologize to Mrs. Reeves. Clear out locker. I look up at her. What? What does last day mean? I have to go, she replies quickly, stuffing her things into a bag and hurrying away into the crowds. Hey, I call after her. Wait up. Come back. But she does not. For God's sake, I mutter to myself, rubbing a hand across my forehead. Language, young man, comes the sharp voice of a teacher behind me. I turn to him. Oh, uh, sorry. He squints down at me. Do I know you, lad? No, I'm... I'm new. Right, well, you'll be expected in registration then, won't you? Name? I give it, and the teacher is, of course, unable to find me in the records of the desk. Well, he says, just spend the morning with Mrs. Reeves, 
your timetable should largely follow that of the other students. Do you know if you're in history or geography? Uh, history, I lie, and the teacher nods. I'll have a schedule printed for you. Roommate G for now though, Sam, and don't let me catch you again. Right, yeah, sorry sir, gotcha. I nod and take a quick leave, running the great barrels of new information through my head as I walk, trying my best to process, to act soundly. Something rumbles in the distance. I swear I can see a glimpse of a shadow pass me by. But when I turn to look for the shadow source, there is nothing there, nor do any of the other kids seem to notice. I swallow anxiously. Control your fear, learn what's going on, and improvise. I have my suspicions already, but it would be good to get confirmation. I follow the letters and numbers written on the doors until I find classroom 8G, whereupon I knock and push through into the room, instantly awkward and aware of every movement of my body, as well as the eyes of the kids behind the desks shift to mine at once. And who might you be? The teacher asks, looking down her glasses at me. My eyes dart from her to the kids in the class, to a girl sitting by herself near the back. Ellie, I blurt out without thinking, to an eruption of laughter from the room. Ellie herself flushes a deep colour and looks down to her desk. Mrs. Reeves looks between us and sighs. I find that very unlikely, young man. Your name, please. Sorry, it's, uh, it's Sam. Well, Sam, you may as well take a seat next to Ellie for now, since you seem to know already. As I walk the length of the room and settle into the seat, the whispers and murmurs and giggles rise up almost immediately. Ellie shoots me a dirty look. What the hell did you do that for? She hisses at me as I sit down. Sorry, I say back. It was an accident. I'm under a lot of stress, okay? Yeah, well, you're not the only one. She mutters under her breath. There's a strained pause. I think of Ellie, the ghost I met not an hour or so ago. Of the journal. Last day. Ellie, I begin softly. How do I phrase this? Are you... are you planning on this being your last day? What? Are you planning to... kill yourself? She swivels to stare right at me. What the hell is wrong with you? She hisses just a little too loudly. Ellie! Mrs. Reeves calls from the front, interrupting her reading of register. Ellie gives her an apologetic look, then turns right back to me. Who the hell are you? Genuinely, what are you doing here, Sam? The exact same questions I was asking her a few long moments ago. I asked first, are you or are you not planning on doing it? She chews her cheek and looks away. No, I'm not. I don't believe you, I say to her. Doesn't matter if you don't believe me, just do me a favour and leave me alone, okay? To this, I say nothing though. A few seconds later, she turns back to me, eyes still downcast. Sorry, I didn't mean that. It's been a tough few days. Sure, it's... yeah, it's okay. We sit together, and yet, I chasm apart. The bell rings to begin the day, and, much to Ellie's annoyance, I spend much of it trailing her around. I'm forced away from her by way of various seating plans and the like. Some kids try to introduce themselves to me, and I ignore them. A little rude perhaps, but I have priorities here. I'm trying to work out the lay of the land. Ellie rejects and pushes back all my attempts to broach conversation. I can tell she's curious about me, but it isn't enough to stop her keeping me at an arm's length. She escapes me through the crowds completely at lunch and disappears entirely for the lesson immediately after. And then, in the final period, I'm witness to an excruciatingly cringy display of her public speaking as she stammers and fumbles for a painfully long time through an extract of Romeo and Juliet. It's so bad, in fact, that I forget why I'm here for a moment and struggle to hold back giggles. Ellie seems less than amused and does not even look back when I call out after her at the end of the day. 2.59pm reads the clock on the lobby wall as I left through the doors. At this time of year, the sun has already begun to sink low in the sky. 
I'm walking behind her and we are leaving the school behind. They let us go a couple of minutes early. A gust of wind ruffles through my hair and rustles the collar of my coat. My mood suddenly drops and I'm met with a stomach churning sensation that I am running out of time. Time. Ellie, I call out, though it's becoming, I find, harder to speak. I'm forced to project to raise my voice beyond a whisper. And there's the sensation again, the feeling of walking through water. I struggle against the winds and the thickness of its air. The lowering sun glints orange and sends Ellie's shadows long and dark back towards me as the gap between us widens. And all around are the creatures now. Slow and rumbling, they push aside the air at various heights. They look down to the girl, hungry and eyes aglow. One looks to me as it rises up and up into the air. Its jaw distends, and the mists shimmer and fog from behind of my side. I am lost in the cloud as I call out for her, but my voice does not work the way it's supposed to. My sight is obscured, and I close my eyes tight shut. But when I open them again, I am stumbling to the floor of the classroom. I land with a clatter and a grunt and a groan. I clamber unsteadily to my feet and try to regather my bearings. Behind me is the mirror, softly shimmering as before. My disheveled reflection looks back at me. The classroom is just as I left it, I think, though it is darker now. We are well into the night. Ellie, or the ghost of Ellie, is humming softly to herself, still studying the projection she has made of my watch's inner mechanisms. She raises her hands and makes little circles with her fingers, and as she does so, the projected gears and cogs turn with them. They slide into new places as she ponders and tweaks. Have fun, she asks without looking over to me. No, I reply, not really. She smirks humorlessly. I'm sorry I wasn't better company. Ellie, I step closer to the girl and sit down on the desk right beside her as the snow rages beyond the window. What happened here? Look, if you haven't worked it out by now, then you're really never going to get it, Sam, she says. So, you ended yourself. Is that it? That was your last day? And you go home from school and take your own life? Take my own life. So dramatic, she murmurs. But still, she does not look directly at me. One of the monstrous eels shivers his way past the window, and this time, I swear I can hear a deep, low hiss to accompany its subtle rumbling. I swallow down a mouthful of fear, and am returned to awareness of how cold the room is. My breath clouds. Was it quite this cold before? The mood shifts. I've never been much good with stuff like this. It's just as well that I can't physically touch Ellie. Otherwise, I'll be trying to work out whether I should awkwardly take a hand or something. Can I... ask why? I say softly. And she finally stops doing what she's doing and turns to look at me. She chews her tongue for a moment, then shrugs and brushes that loose strand of hair behind her ear. I was just... sad, I guess. And there was no real chance for me to be less sad going forward. There was just a lot of stress going on in my life. It was easier for everyone if I wasn't there. Bullcrap, I reply, and she stares at me. Excuse me? I said this bullcrap. And suddenly, I'm angry. How could you do it? How could you do something like that? What the hell is wrong with you? Look at all that you've done. You're trapped here, and you screwed the cosmic order of the universe or something. I don't know. Why the hell do you even care so much? She shouts back at me. Why are you even still here? Just go. Go, Sam. It's too late now anyway. It's done. I shoot a look back behind me, tensed and determined. We'll see about that, I mutter, and turn my back to her. Sam, stop, she shouts as I leave her behind for the second time, as I stride right on back towards the mirror, the shadows of the night blown out, billowing behind me. I step forward through the shimmering gate of the mirror. I am again surrounded by mists and swirling, 
crystalline smoke, and again my footing is lost. I grip my teeth through the fall and stumble to my side as the hard, cold, hard ground finds its place beneath my feet. I knock into a boy beside me, and he grunts with surprise. Hey, watch where you're going, alright? Sorry, I tell him, straightening and pulling out an apologetic hand as I check to confirm my surroundings. The sun's position has changed back to the way it was, back to morning. The school stands before me, and the same roster of faces trudge the way of the steps to the entrance. I glance down to my watch hand to confirm the time, to remember that A, I left my watch behind with Ellie, and B, the watch does not even work anyway. Hmm, fine. It makes no matter. It's the dawn of the day, the same day, final day. I set my jaw and march my way up the steps and into the building. Looking around for her, I bumped into her just over... over here, was it? Why are you doing this, Sam? Comes a voice from above and all around. But I have the good sense not to shout out into the lobby this time in my response. I keep my head down and my mouth shut. And sure enough, there she is, holding her books to her chest as she rounds the corner and heads my way. She looks so sad. My heart throbs painfully, and I push the feeling aside, heading over to her as she approaches. Hey, Ellie. She looks up at me, startled, and stops. Um, hey, hi. Sorry, do I know you? Ah, shoot. Um, no, um, I mean, yeah, you do. My name's Sam. I'm... I'm in the year above you. She wrinkles her nose. No, you aren't. Do you even go to this school? Yeah, right. Just kidding. I'm new. Sorry. I thought we met before, but maybe someone just told me your name. Sorry. There was an awkward pause. What the hell was wrong with me? Stop apologizing, Sam. Okay, well, nice to meet you. She grimaces and strides right past me. I fumed to myself, quietly. You screwed this already, you idiot. I'll screw it. In for a penny, in for a pound, as they say. I put up my hands. Alright, you got me. You know what, Ellie? I'm not in the year above, and I'm not a new kid either. We met early this evening, and you were dead. A ghost. I'm now trying to save you. This is the second time I've played through this school day. She glances over her shoulder at me, but does not slow her pace. She laughs awkwardly. Okay, great. Sorry, I really need to go. 8G, right? Good news, I'm coming with you. She clutches her books a little tighter to her chest as she weaves between the taller kids in the corridor. I put a hand on her shoulder. It's soft and warm, but she flinches away from my touch. Please don't touch me, she says quickly. Right, sure, sorry, but look, please, just hear me out. I know what you've written in your journal, in the purple one. You've written out your last day. You've got bullet points for apologize to Mrs. Reeves and for clear out your locker. She stares at me again as we arrive at the door 8G. How do you know that? Are you some kind of stalker? What do you want? I want you to not do it when you go home from school, Ellie, okay? That's what I want. I say this a little too loudly. Hush falls in the corridor as faces turn to ours and it takes a long, strained moment before the conversation resumes, in a lower tone than they had before. Ellie fumes. Why did you have to say that? She hisses as her eyes start to water and her cheeks flush. My life is none of your concern. Just go away, please. And with this, she turns and pushes through the door into the classroom. And after a beat, I follow. The same spiel plays out as before. Mrs. Reeves asks me to introduce myself to the class, though this time I remember to say my own name. And further, since it's neither recommended by the teacher, nor does Ellie seem in any kind of mood to now engage with me, I decide to give her a little space, and sit instead next to the only other free seat in the room, next to a girl on the opposite side. Hey, she says as I sit down. Hey, so where are you from, new kid? I tell her, and she shrugs. Oh, I thought you might have been from Australia. I hesitate. 
Why would I be from Australia? She shrugs and goes back to doodling in a book. There was a rumour that we were getting a new kid from Australia is all. Shame, I really like the accent. There is another pause as I process this nonsense. Then I chuckle awkwardly. Right, you did just hear me speak though, in front of the class. I wasn't really listening, she says airily. Right. Silence. Mrs. Reeves reads through the register and I tap my knuckles against the desk, then gesture over to Ellie. So, what's her deal then? Who? Ellie. The girl beside me looks up at once, eyes sparkling and eyebrows raised. She puts down a pen and smirks. Do you like her? I flush and try not to respond to this directly. I was just wondering is all. She would definitely date you if you ask. That's adorable. Bit of a warning for you though, new kid. I wouldn't go there. She's not exactly someone worth associating with. And why is that? I ask, briskly. The girl shrugs. I mean, you can if you want, but why bother? It's not like she's interested in anything. But hey, it's a free country, so do what you want, I guess. I look back to Ellie. She sits quietly with a chin in her hand, staring ahead at nothing in particular. A long and slithering shadow is sent swimming across the room. I feel the seat and desk rumble as it passes by, but no one else in the room seems to notice. I swivel in my seat to look behind me through the windows at the back of the class. But there is nothing there. My neighbour looks at me, amused. You're strange, she says simply. Mm-hmm, I reply, still looking through the window for evidence of the watchful, waiting monstrosity. But the bell rings, and the morning begins, and it goes in much the same way as it did last time with a few key differences. Firstly, there's no pretense on my part. I'm 100% honest with Ellie. I walked through a mirror to get here, I tell her in the first lesson of the day, whispering to her from the seat behind. I'm not joking, this is the second time I'm living through the day. Honestly, the teacher's going to use an example from his home life in a minute. Listen. We do so, and sure enough, the guy starts trying to link the subject matter to a semi-amusing anecdote from his week. Ellie glances over her shoulder at me. You're freaking me the hell out. I don't know what you're trying to do, but please, stop. I'm serious. I've been speaking to your ghost, Ellie. I know you love mechanics and how things work. Watches and stuff. You need to listen to me. This is insane, she hisses back. Who have you been talking to? This is cruel. I release a breath of frustration through my nose. Why would you want to do it? I don't get it. Your life doesn't seem that bad to me. Please, don't do this. Get lost. And with that, she turns around and ignores me for the remainder of the lesson, then sprints away the second the bell is rang. I run my hands through my hair. This is not going to work. Maybe I should just do as she says. Just give up and leave her be. I wonder what she's doing now, ghost Ellie. If she's watching me somehow. Or if she's playing around with a watch or sitting alone, huddled in that cold, dark room as the monsters close in. I clench and unclench my fingers. I am here for a purpose. I didn't just stumble onto this school by chance. There is a reason. There must be a reason. And Ellie can be saved. I'm sure of it. So, I keep on trying. Second lesson, I give her a bit of space and try to come up with a plan. I'm struggling to think though as my eyes feel heavier and heavier with every blink. I've lost track of time, and my body clock is all sorts of screwed up right about now. I put my head down in my hands on the desk, just for a minute, and try to think. I see, in my mind's eye, the swirling shadows of eels, eyes glowing in the wintry gloom as the snow cascades all around. I see Ellie, her hair rippling gently as if underwater. She looks back at me sadly as she rises up and out of reach into the storm. I see myself in the blizzard. I see the dark and emptied school collapse all around me and caught in the gale. I see the lights of the street lamps go out one by one as the monsters close the distance. 
their jaws crack open with a hiss of icy steam, and I'm jerked awake from my dreams by a shake of my shoulder. It's Sam, isn't it? Says the teacher, an eyebrow raised as I blink away my sleep. I can hear some of the other students giggling. I can only apologize if my lesson has quite literally bored you to sleep, but do try to stay alert. Thank you. I nod apologetically, and the teacher returns to the front of the class. I look immediately over to Ellie, but her eyes are downcast. Determination runs through me like a river. Save her. I'm able to follow her to lunch this time. She does not escape through the crowds, and so I watch as she gets her food and takes it to the table outside in the sun. It's still pretty cold, but I guess it's where she'd rather be. I take a seat not far away, but one out of her immediate line of sight as I try to plan my next move. I suppress a yawn and mull over my options. And, as I do, a group of kids approach her. Two boys, three girls. Ellie is not looking, but the group are clearly egging each other on. I can't hear what they're saying, but one of the girls is shaking her head and laughing. I watch as another one of them raise a plastic bottle and unclasp the lid. As the bottle is aimed and the first girl suddenly reaches over and squeezes the plastic between her hands and a stream of water is blasted right under the side of Ellie's face, down her clothes and over her food. And the worst part for me is the fact that she doesn't say a damn thing. She stays totally quiet as the group laughs. Oh my god, one of the girls says. I'm so sorry, it wasn't me, it was Karina, she did it. And they keep laughing amongst themselves, passing blame as they make a quick and gleeful exit. Ellie only sits there, in silence. I get up at once to go over and see if she's okay. Hey, I say as I get closer, are you alright? But it's clear as I draw near that it wasn't water sprayed over her based on the smell that rises thick and strong. It's vinegar. Jesus, I mutter as I stand there beside her awkwardly. That's messed up. Ellie says nothing. Her eyes are covered by a fringe, but her cheeks are deep scarlet, and she grabs up her bag and strides suddenly off, leaving her ruined lunch behind. Hey, wait, are you alright, Ellie? I call after her, but she sprints away into the building and disappears round a corner. God damn it, I shout out to no one in particular. A gust of sudden wind rustles my collar. And so, the day goes on. Ellie misses the next lesson, as she did on the first playthrough, though I know why this time. And when she finally returns to English, the last lesson of the day, I feel my chest tightening as I realize that once again, my time is running short. I head right over to her, and she takes a step back at my approach, frustrating me further. Ellie, I'm not your enemy here for goodness sake, I say to her. Please, just hear me out. You're going to be picked on to read a passage out loud today, so maybe just read it over a few times in advance as practice. Act 4, scene 4, I think it was. She squints at me, as if trying to read me, searching for something inside perhaps, and I wait patiently for an accusation or insult. But she says nothing. She simply sighs and walks right past to her seat. I am struck, and not for the first time, by the ethereal kind of deep sadness, one that troubles and dismays me as it washes over me. And as it happens, my advice was useless anyway. Ellie never gets to read out a section of Shakespeare. As the time draws near, instead of watching Ellie get called upon, the head teacher instead opens the classroom door. The heads of all the students turn to look, and he calls Ellie out from the lesson. The class falls into hushed silence as she gathers her things and steps outside. And after another minute or two, I excuse myself to the bathroom and set off in pursuit. It takes me a good five minutes to locate the head's office, but once I do, I crack the door, cringing as I do so and hoping not to be discovered. And I listen in. Very troubling, Ellie, comes the voice of the head. Then he pauses, 
but there is no response from the girl in question. He speaks on. We take threats of this very seriously, young lady. Very seriously indeed. Now, I wasn't there this morning, and I don't know exactly what was said. I grimace and think back on what I blurted out to Ellie in front of all those people. But it's important that we talk this through. You can always rely on us here. Ellie snorts humorlessly. The head clears his throat and continues. And we have arranged for you to speak with the school's counsellor tomorrow morning. This will continue for as long as necessary. I will also, of course, need to inform your parents. Ellie changes her tune here. I can sense the sudden desperation in her voice as she begs. No, sir. Please, don't call my parents. Please. It was just a dumb joke, sir. Honestly. You don't need to call them. Please, don't. I'm sorry, Ellie, but I have a duty of care. And with this, Ellie breaks down. My guilt is sharp as she cries behind the door. And I take my leave. What's the damn point? I return to English and wait for it to come back. But she does not. Then, at the end of the day, I am again waiting by the steps to the school at 2.59. There goes Ellie. She walks right by with her backpack full. I call out to her and she picks up the pace. The air grows thick. No, I mutter out loud. Not again, please. A gust of wind ruffles through my hair and rustles the collar of my coat. It's becoming harder to speak out. I'm forced to project to raise my voice beyond a whisper. And there's that sensation again. That feeling of walking through water. I struggle against the winds and the thickness of its air. The lowering sun glints orange and sends Ellie's shadow long and dark back towards me as the gap between us widens. And all around us return the eels. Slow yet rumbling they push aside the air as they form the mist and shadow. They look down to the girl, hungry and eyes aglow. They are closer this time. One looks over to me. Its hazy yellow eyes meet mine and the clouds shimmer behind and beside. I'm lost within it as I call out for her, but my voice simply does not work in this moment. My sight is obscured, and I close my eyes tight shut. When I open them again, I am stumbling to the floor of the classroom. I trip and crash into a nearby desk with a grunt and grab hold of the counter beside me for balance. It takes a second or two for the world to stop spinning. I catch my breath and watch as Ellie plays with a holograph of the watch. She carefully moves the gear into a new location. I wait for her to speak and eventually she does. She winks and sticks her tongue out at me. No luck again, huh? I am met with a sudden anger and I rise up to full height. What the hell is wrong with you? This isn't a game. I'm trying to save your life. I didn't ask you to do a damn thing, she shouts back. Why do you even care so much about me? I throw out my hands. What do you want, Ellie? Do you want these things to get you? These eels in the sky? What even are they? Do you want to be saved? Ellie makes an oh sound. What a big hero we have over here, she says sarcastically. Big hero wants to save the poor girl. Well, it's too late. My decision was made, and hell, I don't regret it. I'm fine. It's done. It's done and I feel great. You feel great? She shrugs. Sure, why not? I'm not scared. I'm not afraid. I'm not terrified about what's going to happen next. There is no next. I'm free, Sam. I'm free. Well, if that's true, I say, then why not just let those things outside come and get you? Why not leave the building and let them take you wherever? Then you'll truly be gone. Gone forever, I guess. Or wherever they take you. If they're even supposed to be here at all. To this, Ellie says nothing. She just brushes a strand of hair behind her ear, and she looks out the window. The room, I suddenly realize, appears smaller than it was before. The desks and chairs are more closely clumped, and the shadows are darker. The student paintings hung up across the wall. Were their colors always so dark? And some of them, the self-portraits, the eyes no longer look as they did. The lines and the scratches in the paint appear more pronounced. The snowstorm rages, and the monsters drift 
through the wind. This place is getting smaller, isn't it? I asked Ellie, looking around. The walls are closing in, literally. She nods and gives a half smile. It won't be long now, I should think. I slump back down on the desk and watch the snow, thick and white against the glass. I look down at my wrist to get a sense of the time, but of course, there's no watch. And as always, the watch is broken anyway. I turn to observe Ellie, play with it for a minute, or at least the holographic spectral representation of the thing. So, how come you're into that stuff then? I ask her, and she glances at me and brushes the hair from her eyes. It's just the intricacy of mechanisms, she replies, rotating gears, all turning and spinning together to make something work. I just think that is fascinating. They, they make a thing greater than the sum of their parts. I nod quietly as I watch. She shoots me a look. Well, aren't you going to make fun of me? Why would I do that? I reply. You agree? Yeah, I mean, I'm no engineer. My uh, expertise isn't quite to the same level as yours. I point to the ghostly gears and pieces of watch spread out as they are in the air above us. But it's still interesting. Hmm, she says thoughtfully. We sit quietly for a while. After a few minutes, she sticks out a tongue in thought and furrows a brow, experimenting with the watch pieces and trying them in different locations. And I try to force down a rush of feeling. We're running out of time, aren't we? I say. Time? She echoes, then nods. Yeah, we are. I don't want those things to get you, Ellie, and I don't want to be left here alone. I told you, Sam, she says, but she says it gently. There's nothing keeping you here. The door is still there, for now. You could leave if you want. There's something keeping me here, I say quietly. I just can't leave you behind. It's okay, she says, but I shake my head. Tell me about you, I say, and she stops, then swivels on the edge of the desk she sat on to face me. She cocks her head tell you about me? I shrug. Sure, what's your story? My story? She laughs and it's a nice sound, though it fades quickly. She rubs her arm and looks down to the floor. There's not much to tell. My dad was military so he moved around a lot until recently. My parents are nice enough people but they're so cold. I can never talk to them but I also couldn't stand letting them down. She sighs. I was one of those gifted kids, the ones people make memes of nowadays, wasted potential, etc. Honestly, it's a lame story. I like to draw. I like opening things up to see how they work and screwing around with the gears and bolts. I moved to this school two years ago because I was bothered at my last one. It's technically better here, I guess, but nothing works out for me. And I was sick of it, Sam. Sick of not being in control. So, I took control and made a choice. And I should stand by it. She looks right at me. But I don't see surety in her eyes. I don't know what it is that I see. And what about you? She asks. What's your story, crazy boy who wandered into my school? Pretty normal. I was born further north, but moved here when I was really young. I go to St. Richard's school. I don't know that one, she replies. Yeah, it's pretty far away. I don't know how I ended up here, to be honest. It's just where the bus dropped me off. It never gets lost, but last night, I guess it did. I sigh. I like football. My favourite colour is green. School is pretty okay for me, I guess. I'm not one of the popular kids, but, you know, I do okay. She nods. And this watch... It's old. Did it get passed down to you? It was my granddad's originally. That's cool. So why did he give it to you? She asks. Oh, he didn't give it to me specifically. He originally gave it to my older brother. It still worked back then. So did your brother give it to you after? After it broke? Not exactly. 
I reply with a sad smile. I inherited it. After he died. Oh, Ellie says, as the dull sound of the storm rumbles softly outside. I'm sorry. Do you mind me asking how he died? I hesitated, but then... Same as you, actually. Oh. And we say nothing for a while after that. A long, long while. The terrible shadow of a drifting eel passes over the classroom, and it brings with it renewed both the existential and the very active fears I've been battling with since the beginning. Let me help you, Ellie, I say to her, softly. I watch as tears start to run down her face. Sam, I'm sorry, it's just too late. Too late? No, I refuse to believe it. So, without another word, I rise from the desk, I turn and grip my teeth, and return to the mirror, striding on through and wincing as I am once again enveloped by swirling mist and glass-like fogs. I clench my jaw, and with a stumble, land this time on my feet as the vapour-like mists are blown out from my shoes and disappear into nothingness. I struggle with a momentary bout of queasiness, but I force it away. I open my eyes, and there is the school. As always, kids hanging out and heading on inside, and above, drifting through the air, is one of the creatures. Shadowy, smoke-like black, it slithers over the building with a low hiss. I watch, paralysed as it cracks open its jaw, showing me its monstrous teeth as it swims quietly overhead. It brings with it the cold, a chill that shivers across me as I watch the monster disappear into the airs, fading away as quickly as it had appeared. I've got to make this one count. I break the spell and jump up the steps and into the building. I ease my way through the crowd and wait by the corridor I know she's going to come from. Any second now. And there she is. Hey, I say to her as casually as possible. And she looks up at me, in her world, for the first time. Hey, she replies cautiously, and I gesture to the handful of books she's carrying. Can I give you a hand? She just looks at me in confusion, as kids wind their way around us and through the lobby. With your stuff, I mean. I can help carry it if you want. Oh, she says. No, it's fine, but thanks, though. Sure. Hey, could I walk with you? She hesitates again and looks around, looking for some evidence that this is a trap or a play of some kind, and my heart goes out to her. Um, yeah, that's fine, she says quietly, and so we walk together, through the lobby and down the halls to 8G. So, um, are you new here then, or... Yeah, I reply, I'm new. I'm Sam, by the way. Ellie. She gives me a quick half-smile. I'm going to register right now. I'm 8G with Mrs. Reeves. Oh, yeah, that's the same for me. Is she nice, Mrs. Reeves? Yeah, Ellie replies, and I detect a little melancholy in her voice. She is nice. I have to talk to her today. Oh, yeah? How come? I ask. And again, she hesitates as she thinks on how to respond. I just need to apologize for some stuff. She's a good teacher, and I feel like I'm... like I've been letting her down. If she's a really good teacher, then I'm sure she would disagree. Or understand, at least, I offer. But Ellie only shrugs as we enter into the classroom. Once the kids have all settled down, I'm once again asked to introduce myself. I give the correct name and coolly take my seat beside Ellie. I suppress a series of yawns and have to force my eyes open at various intervals as the morning progresses. I'm so damn tired. I am perhaps also a little overbearing in my attempts to get Ellie to open up. I can imagine you, listener, shouting at me to chill the hell out. And I get it. But cut me some slack. I'm under a lot of stress here and time is not on my side. 
I'm just trying to help this girl, okay? Since she seems so reluctant to do it herself. I tell her about when I was bullied as a young kid. Try to get her to open up and turn. She is sympathetic, but a closed book. She's so different to how she is in that classroom, compared with a ghost Ellie. But I persist. She gets frustrated with me at lunch when I refuse to let her sit outside. I try to steer her elsewhere, but she doesn't understand why, nor can I really explain it. I'm distant during the mealtime conversation as I watch with one eye over her shoulder, making sure the group with a bottle of vinegar don't come this way. And then, when it comes time for her to speak out in English, I cringe through a dreadful reading, but do my best to nod along and seem supportive. It's fine, I whisper from beside her, just take your time. But she shoots me a look, and I'm not sure if she even appreciated my support, or was only embarrassed by it. And by the day's end, as the lesson draws to a close, and we're in the process of gathering up our belongings. Hey Ellie, so what are you up to this evening? I ask her, and she laughs nervously. Um, what? This evening? What are you up to after school? I'm busy. Lots of stuff to do. Maybe we could do it together. I gather my courage. Maybe I could come round. The kid at the desk beside us shoots me a look and a smirk. Ellie flushes. You want to come round to my house? Sure. Why? Because... I struggle for justification and swallow my pride. Because I like you and want to spend time with you. You like me? No you don't, you've known me for a day. Her body language becomes more uncomfortable, restless. I'm also not thrilled by this rejection. I'm no ladies man but I didn't think I was that bad of a catch. I think it could be fun. I manage, glancing down to my non-existent watch, and then look up to the clock on the wall. 2.57 Sorry Sam, I'm just... I'm not sure. I'm just worried about you Ellie, is all. I say, conscious of the time, ever ticking away. This makes a pause. She repeats my words. Why would you be worried about me Sam? I shrug and try to deflect. I don't know, I'm just... You seemed a little sad today. I seemed a little sad. Jeez, is there an echo in here? I chuckle anxiously. Sam, you've known me for a day. How do I seem a little sad? I just don't want you being alone tonight, that's all. Maybe I could come back and spend some time with you at your place. She takes a retreating step and adopts a cold, defensive stance. You know something is up, don't you? What do you know, Sam? What's going on? I glance to the clock. The other kids have all filtered out of the room now. 2.58. It's just Ellie and me. Ellie, I just don't want you to do anything stupid. Something you might... regret, I guess. There's still so much to be positive about. You have so much value in your life, even if you don't see it. Ellie puts a sudden hand to her mouth and represses an escaping sob. I begin to panic as her eyes start to fill with tears. It's that obvious. You've known me for a day. A day. And you already know, don't you, that I hate my life. If you can see it, then who else can? Does everyone know and nobody gives a damn? She chokes out her words. I'm just done, Sam. I'm so done with all of it. Ellie, it's... It's okay, I... I didn't... But Ellie runs off. Through the door and down the halls. I take after her. Ellie! But through the school she goes. Out and descending the little stone steps in long strides. And the air grows thick. No, I scream. Please, please just stop. I guess the wind ruffles through my hair and rustles the collar of my coat. There's that sensation again. The feeling of running through water. I struggle against the winds and the thickness of its air. The lowering sun glints orange and sends Ellie's shadow long and dark back towards me as the gap between us widens. No, I cry out. No. And all around us are those terrible, nightmarish creatures. 
They seem faster now, slicker in their movements, rumbling as they push aside the air, slithering through the growing mist and deepening darkness. They look down to Ellie, hungry and eyes aglow. The sky, it would suddenly seem, is full of them. They shimmer with the clouds, and my line of sight is lost beneath billowing mist and swirling fogs. I am falling, my throat hoarse and my hands clenched as the wind rushes past my face. And here I am, stumbling and staggering to the floor of the classroom through the mirror. I keep my footing, but knock into a group of clustered chairs upon my return. I grab hold of a desk for balance as I catch my breath and wait for the world to stop spinning. I retch as my chest rises and falls, rises and falls. I look up to see Ellie sat there, cross-legged on the counter. She isn't playing with a watch this time. She makes no jokes. She's just looking at me in silence. The counter is closer to the mirror than it was before. The room is smaller, yet the window, it seems, is wider. I can see the monstrous eel squirming patiently in the world beyond, drifting through the snow and the storm in the darkness. The rumbling is ever-present now, anticipatory and warning. I can feel the vibrations through the wood of the desk. They are closing in. Slowly but surely, the walls are closing in, and the window is widening, and the storm is growing stronger. I sigh. I keep failing, Ellie. She says nothing. Do you even want to be saved? Again, she says nothing. I don't get angry though this time. I just rub my jaw and look through the window. I'm not some delicate flower that needs saving, Sam, she says. I can't just sit by, I say desperately. I can't just sit by and watch you throw your life away. I made my choice, Sam. It's done. But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't. The mirror, the creatures. You've been given a second chance, don't you get it? And you have to take it. You have to take it. It's my life. I'm allowed to do with it what I choose. But is this what you want, Ellie? What you actually want? It can't be. I'm sure of it. I've seen it in your eyes. A part of you regrets this. All of this. I'm not happy when I'm alive, Sam. She says firmly. And I was tired. So tired. And now I'm free. But don't you get it? Don't you see? That way that you are now. Inquisitive and funny and lively. And... And you give out as good as you get. You're self-assured and confident. She flushes. This, Ellie, this is how you could be all the time when you're alive. I'm not saying it's easy, but... But practice makes perfect. A change of mindset is a good start. Get some meds. Get some professional advice. A change in how you project yourself. I stumble over my words. I know I'm spewing a lot of cliches here, but I'm speaking from the heart. In the corner of my eye... I catch glimpses of the painted portraits across the walls, clumped together now. There is essentially no wall space between them. The faces are dark and twisted, scary and unsettling. I struggle to focus on them for too long, as one struggles to focus on faces in a dream. Ellie looks to my grandfather's watch, majestic but broken on the surface of the desk. She puts out a hand and the projected gears and cogs all spin in an intricate pattern right above it. And very softly, she says one more thing. You can't fix a person's head in a day, Sam. No, I reply, perhaps not, but I can convince them to live till tomorrow. And so I turn, exhausted, shadows swim in the corners of my vision, and my movements seem paradoxically both airy and sluggish. But I stride onwards, with the rumble of the eels and the hiss of their terrible jaws in the back of my head, with the roar of the winds in my ears, with body bruised but constitution sharp. I go for one more time. And this will be my last time. I can feel it. No more chances now, as I make my final march to the mirror between the worlds. So... Through the mirror I go, wary but bitterly determined. Ellie wants to live, 
She might still be too stubborn to admit it, but she wants to live. I can see it. I can feel it. I know what a will to live looks like, damn it, and what the lack of one looks like too. The world warps around me. The rumbling and the hissing grows louder as a crystalline smoke and mist blows up and around my face and the wind roars. But I land squarely on my feet. The clouds dissipate and without skipping a beat, I head directly towards the school doors. The shadows seem ever darker now. There are monsters in the air. I can see them, though I pay them no mind, ignoring the fear that tries to take its hold of me as I walk. As I approach the front doors, I allow a deep breath before heading inside. All around me is the typical, childlike bustle of a relatively mundane school day. Supposedly, at least. But this is anything but. It is extraordinary, because I get to spend it with Ellie, the most interesting girl I have ever met. And there she is. She hasn't noticed me yet, but she approaches, clutching a box to her chest. I gather my courage and from above comes a voice. Ask me about my jacket, she says in a whisper. Make sure you ask about the jacket. I log her words as her past self enters into speaking distance. Hey, I say to her, and she smiles and looks up at me. I smile and cautiously she smiles back. I shrug apologetically. Sorry to bother you. I say with a lopsided grin that comes all too naturally. I'm new here. I pause. Well, kinda. I'm only here for the day, really. And I think I'm supposed to start in 8G. Oh, she replies. Um, yeah, I'm in 8G. Do you... do you want me to show you? I nod. Yeah, that would be great, thanks. And after she gestures, I fall in step alongside. I comment on a coat. I like a jacket. It's true. She looks at me, gauging my authenticity. For real? For sure, it's cool. She took a strand of loose hair behind her ear. Thanks, she says, and I hear warmth in her voice. My name is Ellie, by the way. It's nice to meet you. And you, I reply. My name is Sam. And so, the day goes on. A day like so many before. A day uniquely and tragically beautiful. Many days are, I start to realise, when no one cares to consider. I actually pay attention to her as a person today, not just as a project to fix. I notice for the first time the flash of a shining silver watch of her own beneath her sleeve, and I ask her to show it to me. She does so gladly. I ask her where she got it, and she says it was a gift from her parents for good grades, about three or so years ago. She gets sad and tells me she doesn't do so well in school anymore. She finds it harder and harder to focus, to care. Her grades are slipping, and she feels like they'll never come back up. I just don't have the right headspace, she murmurs to me as she doodles in the corner of a textbook. I doubt that, I reply. I don't know how to advise you, but... I really believe you can get back into the zone. Someone like you? You can find a way back. She scoffs, but I catch a little smile as she does so. I talk to her about my own watch, how it's broken and timeless. I describe it to her, and she suggests some ideas on how to fix the thing. But of course, her suggestions go in one ear and out the other. She laughs when she catches the expression of cluelessness on my face, and the day goes on. I sit with her at lunch, on the little table just outside. I watch as the bitterly familiar group of kids approach. Two boys, three girls. They aren't in Ellie's line of sight, but they're clearly in the process of egging each other on. I wait for them to approach, but it's taking them longer to do so this time. I think my presence here is making it harder for them to make up their minds. I decide to call out to them preemptively. Are you guys okay over there? I say amiably enough. They laugh as if sharing some intense and intimate joke. They come a little closer. You two having fun? One of the boys says as a girl glances to her friend with a grin, raising the water bottle filled with vinegar at the two of us, moving to unscrew the lid. I reach up and grab it right out of her hand. 
As expected, the group acts as if I've done them some great dishonor. Chill, what the hell? One of them says. You were going to squirt this right at us, I reply. We weren't, a girl replies. Yes, you were, I reply, deadpan. Ellie watches with a raised eyebrow. She seems less intimated this time. More bemused. We were just screwing around, man, says one of the boys. Right, is my only reply. I let the word hang, dead in the air, waiting until they continue the laughter and go about their way and on with their conversations. But crucially, Ellie and I are able to go on with ours. Then, when lunch comes to an end, I tell Ellie I'll meet up with her in class and take a little detour. I approach the bench that they're sitting on and raise the bottle up high, opening the lid and blasting a cold stream of vinegar under the backs of all their heads. I take off, laughing, as they scream and squeal with distress. The hours of the day roll by. I push through my exhaustion, doing my best to brush away Ellie's concern when she comments on it. I just smile at her and hope that the dark circles beneath my eyes are, at the least, somewhat aesthetic. The orange-yellow glow of the sun filters in through the classroom windows. It catches in her hair as she brushes it behind her ear and it glints with a watery shine in the pools of her eyes. The sound of the general muttering and murmuring of our classroom is a faint but steady backing melody from all around, accompanied by the occasional scrape of a chair and the scribbling of pens on paper. No one but me notices the orange-yellow light is lost beneath sudden shadow. As the arctic breeze blows in from the only open window, as the blinds are thrown back from the glass, and the enormous, spectral eel from beyond the plane drifts hungrily past. Closer than ever before, I hear it rumble. It shakes the desk and rattles the wall as it swims impossibly by. Black, grey and slick, terrible in pursuit. I do my best not to react as its hiss shivers through the shade. I try to still the existential fear that has plagued me since the beginning. I try to block the monster from my mind's eye. The clock on the wall of the classroom ticks. Tick, tick, tick. And after a shiver, the light returns. When English comes around, I volunteer to speak in Ellie's place. I offer to read aloud the passage of Romeo and Juliet before the teacher can call upon her. And hey, I flub some of the harder sentences, but I do a pretty good job. To be honest, I think that most of the kids in the class were relieved to some degree or another that they didn't have to suffer through the anxiety of being picked on either. The day, as it always eventually does, is drawing to a close. 2.57pm The teacher lets us out early, and we walk, Ellie and I, side by side down the length of the corridors as the bustle and clamour filters out through the doors around us. Each footstep feels heavy. The sound of the clocks grow louder and louder with each tick of the hand, and each blink feels heavier and heavier on my eyes. Hey, Ellie says to me as we leave the day behind us, as our imprints drift and dance from place to place in the building's memories. I was wondering, um, do you have a Snapchat or anything? Sure, I reply, reaching for my phone. But of course, it isn't there and I cannot for the life of me remember my username. I apologize and tell her this. Ah, uh, she shrugs and brushes a strand of hair beyond her ear. That's no worries, here's mine. She reaches into a bag for a purple journal and tears off a corner of a page, scribbling her username down onto a paper before handing it to me. Or you could just give it to me tomorrow if you want. I shift. I'm not quite sure if it's my imagination, but I swear I can hear the steady, repetitive beat of a drum in the distance, over and over in time to the ticking of the clock. Ellie, the thing is, I say as we pass through the lobby and out of the doors, into the brisk, cool air beyond. I don't think I'm going to be here tomorrow. In fact, I definitely won't be. I'm just passing through. She stops and turns to look at me. Oh, she says. That's right. There's a pause. You know, I never did ask you, 
What's the reason for that? Why would a kid like you show up to a school for a single day and then just disappear? I smile at her, but I fear that it doesn't quite reach my eyes. The light of the steadily lowering sun shines bright on her face. It's like I'm seeing her in high definition as the breeze gently rustles her hair. She adjusts the bag and cocks her head at me. The clock ticks. Ellie, I have to go now, I say simply, trying to keep the emotion in my voice to a minimum. Can she feel it? Can she feel the intensity and importance of this moment? You have to go now, she laughs. So dramatic. She knocks me on the shoulder, and after an intimate hesitation, she passes me by and sets off down the road and steadily away from the school. I don't know what I'm going to do without you though, she calls back over her shoulder. A joke, sure, but its depth does not go unnoticed. You only met me today, I call to her as the wind blows, ruffling my hair and rustling the collar of my coat. Who knows who you'll meet tomorrow? The air thickens all around, and the lowering sun glints orange. It sends Ellie's shadow long and dark back towards me as the gap between us widens. But it illuminates her silhouette, a bright outline of shimmering golden light. I take a difficult step forward, and I am, for the last time, falling through the mist and swirling crystalline fogs. The wind rushes past my face and ears, and the gale is loud as I breathe in a blast of icy, wintry air. Tears run from my eyes against my will, and I stumble through the surface of the mirror and into the familiar, deserted classroom with a crash. And when I find the strength to look up, it truly is deserted this time. Dark and empty, there is no one else here. There is no Ellie. I wipe a sleeve across my eyes. The shape and size of the place has returned to its normal metrics, and the lights, I don't fail to notice, are all off. No yellow light filters in through the glass of the classroom door from the corridor. The pictures and paintings on the walls no longer appear frightening or in any way threatening, and whilst my heart beats fast, they do not appear to be any great monsters drifting through the snowstorm outside. Ellie? I murmur, but there is no response. She's gone. And you know, I think it might just be time that I left as well. So, I take my grandfather's watch from its place on the desk and hastily attach it around my wrist, pushing out through the door and walking steadily through the cold shadows and down the stairs, through corridor after corridor, until I return to the lobby. I pass by the emblem of the school, emblazoned on the wall. At Meloria, at Lusum. I'll research it when I get home. I'll find out where this place is, exactly. The coordinates, if I have to, just in case. I reach into my pocket for Ellie's note, the one she tore from a purple journal. But it's not there. To my frustration, I find that that too has gone. I struggle with an emotion I find difficult to describe. Was I successful? Was I enough? Did I save her? Did I save Ellie? Or was it too late? I hesitate at the entrance to the school. I turn and take one last long look around the lobby. One final check. Waiting. Waiting and hoping that Ellie might appear to me one last time. To let me know she's okay. To say goodbye at the least. But... She does not appear, and nothing happens. The wind whistles beyond the doors. And so, I take my leave. I push on out into the cold as my hair is blown back from my head, and I stride out into the snow and the haze, trudging through it and back to the road, following the familiar orange glow of the street lamps, continuing my route and pushing ever forward. I see a face in my mind's eye. I hear her voice in my head. I have to get home now, I think to myself, before I collapse from exhaustion into the snow. My parents are probably worried sick after all. I don't even know how long I've been lost. I raise my watch to my face and squint through the snow. It catches in the orange glimp of the street lamps. 
and it ticks. I pause for a second beneath the overhead glow, and I watch as the intricate hands of my grandfather's then brother's watch go surely and steadily ground. Dutifully around the face of the watch they go, ticking on and on as they were always supposed to. Huh, I murmur aloud as I set off into the storm.